Hey! What's up, everybody? We're gonna do a debate. Actually, right off the bat, we're just gonna fucking get into this debate. And my hair is kind of fucked up. Got some dry ass hair. To start this shit off. Motherfucker. Motherfucker. Shit is dry as hell. Shit is in my eyes. Shit is in the sky. Shit is not knowing why. Shit don't lie. What the fuck is up, everybody? We got some oranges in the chat because I'm being orange as hell today. I'm red as hell. I'm Mr. Krabs today, and we're going to be hunting for some Squidward tentacles. You understand? We're going to be debating Squidward. We're going to be debating Squidward tentacles. And we're red as hell on this bitch because I'm Mr. Krabs. Yes. What up, Gopher? Thank we you so much. tonight, Gorilla. Son. Go for right here, we straight soldiering out in this bitch, red like Mr. Krabs. Gonna take on that motherfucking blue Squidward. Blue as hell. Squidward, blue as hell. He's blue as hell. Alright, I got the StreamYard link. And should we just hop right into it? I mean, I don't... I ain't got much else to say. The Washington Post reporter's watching me right now. Hey, bitch, what up? Ugly ass bitch. Ugly ass goddamn journalist. Y'all, even y'all, Paul Mason, y'all can collaborate. Bring me down. You a fuck, bitch. You can't do shit. Bitch ass journalist. That's what I got to say. I think I give a fuck about that bullshit. You work for a fucking Washington Post. I'll wipe my fucking ass with that Washington Post. Washington Post on my ass. Wipe it all off on the toilet paper. Charmin extra strong. That's what I got to say about your level of talent. Oof. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. They don't got this. They don't got this on the left. You understand? Look at this. Look at this. They ain't got that. Okay, let me blow my nose. Give me a sec. All right, all right. Damn. So I just want to give you guys a reminder. Uh, I'm not going to have be streaming tomorrow because it's going to be Father's Day. So there's going to be no stream tomorrow, okay? No stream tomorrow because of Father's Day. So I want you all to know that, understand that. Uh, be clear about that. I'm going to be with my family tomorrow. Usually I'm with family on Saturdays. But, uh, you know, it's going to be Sunday this time around because it's Father's Day. Okay, so there's an occasion. Family's coming together and doing shit. You understand? Ooh, we got a, we got a green in the chat like my shirt. Green like my shirt. Based. Do you see Jimmy any Glenn on Tucker? Also, Jank Weaker smearing Jimmy Glenn and Brianna Joy a gray as fake left. 
Jank is a fat fuck, and I hope that guy can go fuck himself as soon as possible. Jank is a fat fucking loser, bitch. All his fucking... Yeah, they're all feds. All these people on Twitter, they, you know these Bernie people on Twitter? They're all feds. They're all sellout scum pieces of shit. And they're always going after Jimmy Dore, me, Jackson, and others. They're the scum of the earth. Like that fucking guy. I want you guys to type in Twitter, at The Wasting Times. Biggest fed on Twitter. The Wasting Times. He's got a Lego profile picture. And his name is Ogil. The Wasting Times. That little bitch is one of the most... Obs that's, that's all Bernie's people. That's all from his campaign and from his movement. And it's a DNC version where they co-opted Bernie's shit and they implanted these deep state, uh, you know, progressives to hijack the whole thing. Dude's a fucking creep. Creepy, creepy fuck. But uh, that's okay, because we got info on that person. We got info on that. Okay, I'm going to join uh, Zoltanius's shit. So, just to give you a recap... Zoltanius made an 80-minute video. Thank you, Lila Lila. As a Lebanese-American, what is Mia Khalifa's reputation in oh, the community? Also, is it true some Lebanese call themselves descendants of the Roman First Empire? First of all, we don't know who that is. We ain't got nothing to do. We don't say shit about that because we ain't got nothing to do with that, okay? Second of all, um, no, for real, for real, Lebanese people do not sit around and talk about famous Lebanese people. They're like, you talk about your relative, talk about your cousin or some shit. No one's gonna, nobody cares just because they're Lebanese, right? And then I'm sure some are descended from those Romans. You know, probably some of them. But uh, probably not a whole lot, you know. Because after all, we are indigenous, Phoenician, Afro-Asiatic, Mediterranean males, right? And I'm probably Persian. Of, I'm, I'm half Persian and half Phoenician, probably. All right. We're doing this bullshit, so I gotta disable my video. And you know what? I'm just gonna keep the video, actually. And I'll just do this. I'll just uh, enable the virtual cam, right? We'll do uh, Streamlabs virtual cam. Oh, we can't. Can we? No, it don't work. It don't work. All right, that's okay. Deactivate. Oh, uh, we just do the this one. Okay, we're gonna do this, and then I'm gonna take this. Ah, uh, okay. We're gonna put this here. Where the fuck is this? Where the fuck is this? Here, here it is. Take this. Yeah, this one. This. I will just leave it like this for now. All right, so some background, guys. <clears throat> Give me a second. There's some shit in my throat. I just ate some spicy ass food. Anyway, um, this dude made an 80 minute video calling me a liar, saying I was being dishonest. So we're gonna sort out and see uh, what exactly was dishonest about what I said. So let's enter the studio. Yeah. So yeah, there's um. Who's here? There's obviously a lot. Here, guys. Of... Oh, okay. I'll, I'll shut up. <laughs> Get everybody here. All right, cool.
guess we're just going to wait. You want to do most of the talking, Fasifus? No, I mean, you can start off. I'll butt in later. I mean, I don't really know what to start with, so. <laughs> is, he, is he muted or is he just not talking? I don't know. Oh, he's there. Hello? Oh. Yeah, we can hear you. Hello. All right. So basically, here's my business here. So let me just, uh, before we get into every single thing point by point, I want to focus on the main thing of your video. So the thing that I took a special notice of from your video is that, you know, if you want to disagree with me or try to push back on my ideas, you know, that in itself, I don't really think is bad or... Uh, you know, necessarily dishonest or snaky or whatever. That's fine. You know, it's a free country. But you also said that I'm a liar. And you said that I'm hiding my real views to disguise some Satanism. So that's really what I want to revolve this around. What exactly have I been dishonest about? And what did I lie about? Go ahead. Well, I think it's very obvious that you're just adopting right-wing views and trying to use it as a form of opportunism to castrate any actual right-wing views or right-wing movements and then frame them into Marxist-Leninism. And then once you get like these idiots in Marxist-Leninism, Marxist they can then push them down the rabbit hole of leftism, which I've seen people in your Telegram chat before say they don't agree with everything you're saying. They just consider it good propaganda. So it's obviously just a way to get people in there and brainwash them into your cult. So you don't think I'm genuine about my own views? No, uh, I see no difference between people like you and Vosh. Okay, so I'm not genuine about my own views. No, you're a okay, humanist. Okay, so that's a good place to start. So you characterized my views as right-wing. Can you identify what is actually right-wing about my views? Well, I would say elements of things that you're trying to adopt that are right-wing into there, what I, I would say is like the, the conservative views. You want to appeal to the American right. You said that the revolution before is not going to come from the left. So you're trying to bring in these right wing people and then funnel them into your ideology. You're trying to misdirect where they're actually going into, okay. the, into the left. But I also said right wing people and apolitical people, which is suggesting to me that a lot of right wing people are not in it for the ideology like you because they read some books and are committed to a doctrine because they're speaking from their intuitions and their common sense. So, again, I'm going to ask you the question. What about my views specifically are actually right wing? Well, if we're talking like right wing, I would say that you're not particularly anti-religious, though you, you are yourself uh, an atheist, correct? So would you characterize the Communist Party of the Russian Federation in addition to virtually almost every communist party that exists in the Middle East and Latin America as right wing? Because they're also not anti-religious. Uh, well, if we're talking about, like, say, the Soviet Union... Uh, when they brought back the church under Stalin, I would not say that it was right wing because that was it was reflectant of the defunct national church idea within Nazi Germany. They were subverting actual Christian doctrine and Islamification within Marxism is considered by a lot of traditional school Sufis to be like one of the biggest subversions of Islamic thought. Which Sufi schools uh, in particular? Gunanism. Gunanism is not a school of Sufism. Gunan is a secondhand. A Western adopter of some Sufi ideas, but I'm not familiar with Gwinnon representing any uh, school of Sufism within traditional Islam. Uh, I mean, as far as like I, I've interacted with like traditional school people, that they, they, they said they consider him a Sufi. So. Yeah, he adopted Sufi ideas, but he was not actually formally part, or I should clarify, he didn't actually found any real Sufi school of thought that's traditional. It's a very modern, mm -hmm. heterodox approach. But we're kind of veering off and rambling a little bit. So I asked you if the Communist Party of the Russian Federation, which is the second largest party that exists within the Russian Federation today, is anti-religious. You responded to me by saying that you don't think Stalin's nearly, you know, half a century ago, revival of the Orthodox Church uh, was particularly I mean, uh, re uh, religious. But, you know, we can get into the argument about that, but it's not even what I asked you. But if, if well, you I mean, if we're talking about like modern like communism, no, I don't really think it particularly is within Russia. 
like I know like people okay. like Dugan refer to that as like national communism. So they're basically trying to implement uh, messianic traditions and other so contradicting uh, things of Marxism in there is more of a geopolitical aim to undermine the United States, but it's more like a hollow traditionalism. Okay, does does Zayuganov and the actual theorists of the Communist Party characterize uh, their ideology as national communist? No, uh, Dugan says they re reckon themselves as being orthodox Marxists, but they're really not. Okay, well, that's, what, that's your opinion, right? So that's the Communist Party of the Russian Federation. What about the Communist parties within the Middle East, the Communist Party in Lebanon, in Iraq, in Syria? Um, what about in Latin America? What about the various you know, socialist and communist parties there? What about the ruling party in, in Venezuela? So all of these people are not um anti-religious but they are considered within their respective countries to be on the left so i'm just mm -hmm. trying to understand why are you getting this idea that not being anti-religious is inherently right wing well i would say people who aren't religious themselves are falling in with like in humanist tradition so they're veering off into the left but they're trying to cater to re religion, which is given the veneer Wait. of uh, cultural conservatism. Okay, so are you trying to say that Western kind of liberal, irreligious, kind of nihilistic type of people, those are humanists? And those are atheists in the same sense that Marxist Leninists historically were atheists? Yeah, there's no difference between any of that. Beautiful. Okay, that's where we can begin. So in your mind, Western um, nihilistic hedonism, which is just irreligious, is the same thing as the communist attitude toward religion in the past, which was not actually based on rejecting the belief in anything and, you know, resigning to oneself to some kind of, you know, nihilistic view of the world where it's just consumerism and nothing matters and you go with the flow. You know, they actually had a, as Dugan himself put it in one of his own works, um, on Guinan, actually, one of his articles, that Marxism was actually a subversion of temporality in modernity, because it proposed an eschatological and teleological view of time within modernity that oriented it with purpose. So in Dugan's own view, and he's reciting Guinan himself, the communist atheism has nothing to do with the atheist nihilism of the modern West, because communism was actually purpose-oriented, and it was teleological, and it was the number one contradiction, and Dugan called it the most subversive language uh, within the language of modernity. That's Dugan's own words, ad verbatim. Mm -hmm. um, I'm solo. I mean, yeah, I, I would just say, like, we all come from, like, a sort of Christian background here, all, all of us here. So the idea that, like, if someone replaces Christianity with something else, be it a belief in some sort of historical or dialectical materialism or in any sort of belief or a lack of belief in God, which is which translates into some sort of, like, materialism, as in materialism in the sense, like, oh, I want, like, items, I want you to, uh, consumerism if you will. I mean, like for all of us, it's all like the same thing for us, the way that we view it. Okay. Like, so no, like difference within. Yeah. That. But first of all, it's not the same in Dugan's view. And second of all, that assumes that Marxism is replacing Christianity, which is actually not right. Marxism is specifically focusing on the world in a particular way that the church. Yeah, no, I would say that 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 necessarily um, is a if you take Christianity seriously, if you take like the sort of resurrection of Jesus and the death of Jesus and what he did while you know dead on the cross, if you take those things seriously, and if you also take uh, what Marx said seriously, then there's a contradiction between those. Like, okay, I think why, why is there a contradiction? Kind of contradictory um, because with like Christianity, Christianity, the way properly viewed Christianity is like the story of stories in the sense that there is supposed to be no other um, narratives or any other thing that you're supposed to believe in. But if you believe in like the sort of teleology of Marx, you sort of have okay. to put uh, the Christian tele teleology aside and sort of just have a belief in the um, in this world instead of uh, like an afterlife or anything like okay. that. So you would just character. OK, so you don't believe in anything but Christianity, then it's only just it's only Christianity. For me, everything is within the Christian lens. Okay, if that makes so sense. So that's that's a nothing burger because I asked you, do you believe in something beyond Christianity? And I already know what the answer is. Well, yes, no. you believe in third position. You believe in the third way, don't you? Yeah, but well, that's an offshoot of my Christianity more than okay, anything. Okay, well, else, in the same way, communists within Russia and Latin America and the Middle East will also say that their communism is an offshoot of their religious beliefs. How is what you're saying more correct than what they're saying? Because I don't, because I think communism, the the metaphysics and the sort of like the ideology of communism necessarily contradicts with like Christianity, okay. like the sort of like belief in like a human nature, different beliefs in human nature, for instance. Okay. What are the different beliefs in human nature? 
Um, uh, Francis with like Marx is sort of like more dialectical view of human nature versus the, the Christian more sort of like existentialist view, I guess you could say. Hold more on. transit. I just have to cut you off for a second because sure. you, you said that it's in contradiction because Marx is dialectical. Marx derives his dialectics from Hegel's, I mean, like literal Christian tripart dialectic. Well, well I'm not logic. a Protestant. I'm like, Hegel was like a really bad Protestant. So, I mean, I don't really care what Hegel had to say because it's, okay. it's all heretical to me. Sure. But Hegel was also drawing from the pre-Protestant Christian philosophical and hermetic traditions from the Middle Ages, which also contained this tri this tripart, di this same tripart dialectic logic. So how can not you say that it's dialectics that makes Marx have a different view on human nature than Christianity? Because that's actually what unites them. Well, so well, I'd like well, to well, chime well, in here because uh, on, um, Hegel's understanding of God is not similar to what was understood in the Middle Ages. That's not which what is I the said. Idea that, that is literally not what well, I said. Well, it's, 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 a, it's a complete break because beforehand, beforehand, if you take, for example, what Aquinas said about God, which is the fact that it's, he's, you know, he's omniscient, he's benevolent, and he was wise to create the universe, but he could have chose not to have created the universe. The whole point of Hegel is that the universe had to have been created, and in a way, he was trying to bring that... Um, yeah, I get it. He's that, the Protestant. Uh, the Trinity but, down back to Earth. So there's actually a very rational 100%. and secular side to Hegel that... Um, is yeah, I, I don't agree with that. Effective. I think uh, the idea that he is really. Uh, I, I'm, we're, listen, there's no need to. He knew something about God. Listen, before, there's, there's no need to get into it because I don't think Hegel is like some devout religious guy. I didn't say that, but I said his the logic of his dialectic, not the quality of his belief in God, but the logic implied in his dialectic is derivative of almost all historical traditions of Christianity. Yeah, I mean, if you want to say that. Like, if I may real quick, I mean, if you want to say that there's a sort of like, you know, dialectics between like Old Testament, and New Testament or something like that, that's fine. But what I meant specifically, I said, um, like the like human nature being dialectical um, in the sense that like humans change their environment, which changes us. I think that's a very anti-Christian thing because Christians were very explicit about what our human nature is. And it's not like a changing thing. It's a very like, you know, God given thing because we're made the Im in the image of God. OK, so can sense. you describe the content of that image of God to me? What do, you, what do you want exactly like? So you said Christianity has a fixed view of human nature, whereas Marx appears to not. So what is the fixed view of na human nature within the Christian perspective? Well, it's this idea that we are able to like, be like uh, at least for me as an Orthodox Christian, I don't want to speak for other um, sort of traditions, but for our, us, it's the idea that um, we believe that we can like sort of become God and that we have the possibility to sort of be united, not become God rather, but be in union with God through theosis. Yeah, that... And we also believe that in this current world that we don't believe in like original sin, or human, but we do believe humans are like sinful. Yeah, th these are things that characterized Soviet communist ideology a one to one. But I wanted to add, I mean, implicitly at least, but I want well, to ask you. That we um, don't believe that like, our human nature is changed by our environment. No, no. So. You just said that man can be, man can strive toward divinity and that, you know, this, this is all defining the aesthetic and the nature of how the Soviet ideologists were describing communism and how they were articulating, you know, working toward this, this bold communist future and becoming like. But, you know, but if you're working towards the bold communist future rather than through unification with God, you're replacing that. Why are they in contradiction? Because your your goal should be to focus on unification with God, not Again, like some what does it mean earth? to focus on unification with God if not to build communism? Well, I don't, I don't, I, I just, I just, I'm not a communist, so I don't see how communism has anything to do with building up to God. Well, and if you look through like what the church fathers say, we have like icons of saints burning, you know, um, portraits of Lenin. Like you're not going to tell yeah, me but that you like, also you know, have, Christianity is like secretly communist. You you know as well as I do that the political stances of the various churches differ across time and also place. And even like literal geographic place, some churches have murals of Stalin. Some churches have hammers and sickles inside of them within Russia. So what you're saying I is... I mean, from like maybe like from a historical, like, like to show like the history of something they do, if you're speaking of like that one, like a that one cathedral or church in Russia. I mean, it's, it's not, they're not doing that to sort of praise the hammer and sickle rather what they're doing is sort of like show my understanding is at least it's like a historical thing. Oh yeah. You know, us, the Russian people, we went through this. No, there's literally an alliance between the communist party and the Orthodox church. You can look it up. They are actually politically in alliance with each other, but I wanted to ask you uh, something because 
You gave me a description of human nature, which is actually devoid of content. You described to me a specific form. It doesn't have a specific content in the real world. So I ask you again, what is the fixed nature of human nature within Christianity that differs from Marx's view? Because you the told me something. Of human, of human nature is that we are made in the image of God. Sure. Okay. And, 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 and there's nothing, there's nothing that like, there's nothing that like sort of changes that, that doesn't change. Like human nature isn't something that's in flux. Okay. Well, Marx also doesn't believe it's in flux. So I don't know why you're saying that. It's, a, it's like a dialectical view, though, that if we can change our environment and our environment and our environment can change us. So and it's, hold on. In, in that you, sense, it's sort of like modernistic. And there's okay, no being hold on. You just you just told me that man is made in the image of God. That is literally a dialectical statement. How? Because you are positing man and his if in this within this discursive context. But God, but God isn't changing. Like if you say God, is no, changing, it, that's it, a forget change. OK, change comes after. But first, you have two opposite principles that are united. That's a dialectic. Or no, at least are, that. are interacting. It's not, it's not opposite. In, within the, the discursive... God, it, hold on. Within this discursive context, it is an opposite. Otherwise, the identity of God and man would be indistinguishable. That's what... Yeah, yeah except that's what, that, that's what we believe. Yeah, but... That's a, the, the yes, you, 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 you we are, believe we are that, We're not like which is a dialectical like belief. Because dialectics posits a unity of opposites, but first you have to make the no, opposite. There's no, there's no, there's no opposites though. But you are literally saying the unity of man and God, and you're you're beginning with two opposing intelligibles, which no, you're no, reconciling. You're you're, 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 you have this a priori assumption that they're like different. No, I don't. But I'm not saying they're different. I'm just saying, in order to give expression to the unity. You have to get also give expression to the opposing principles, it's just like the Trinity within Christianity. All three represent one God, right? But you have to give expression to all three principles, uh, or else the notion of the Christian God, at least, is not complete. Yeah, no. So there is like, I mean, you can see that like the Trinity is like, if you want to see it in some way, the Trinity is dialectical or whatever. I'm like, okay with that, depending on on the how exactly you're using that word. But I'm seeing the idea that like human nature is changing, though. Uh, we don't we don't subscribe. Marx to that. does not say human nature is changing. Okay, then what, what is the Marxist view of human nature? How would you? Marx it? gives a specific description of human nature, not as something changing, but as something that is rather defined by our, um, let's say, relations of production. Or our relations to how we reproduce our conditions of life. But as Engels would point out later, this cannot be interpreted in a narrow economic sense. They are talking about the real conditions for the reproduction of life, which also possess spiritual form. Okay, so that reproduction of the conditions of man, if man is made in the image of God, as you just pointed out, mm -hmm. and Marx says that the way in which man reproduces himself is what defines man, then how could there be a contradiction? The man in question is still the man made in the image of God. It only seems like the difference is you don't give any acknowledgement to the fact that we have to work for our humanity and work for our lives. But I think that contradicts the view of Orthodox Christianity according to which we have to carry our cross up the hill. We have to work for our faith. We have to work for our being. I think that is a fundamentally Christian view, even an Orthodox Christian view. So, I mean, if you're saying that the the means of production can like change, I know you have like, I know you don't just literally mean like you know like heavy machine or heavy factories or whatever. You have a much more sort of uh, broad definition of that. But if you're saying that can like change us, and then again, that's like anti-Christian still. It doesn't change us. It's just that we can't make assumptions and be idolaters and say this is all a human being is. Our relationship to nature does Wait, how, change. How, like, what sense are you using idolatry there? Like, well, what do you because mean by I that? think if you were to say, like, how's idolatry? If you were to say, for example, that a human being is only capable of this specific relationship to nature, this specific form of culture, this specific form of art, and this specific, you know, image of man, I think that would be a form of idolatry. If man is made in the image of God, and your image of man is somehow fixed, then I think you're basically trying to create an idol, a fixed idol of what God is. How can you profess to know God? I think the hermeneutic by which we establish the fact that man is made in the image of God 
is precisely um, suspended in the historical materialist view through historical epochs whereby man what revolutionizes. Do mean, what, do you, what, do you, what do you mean suspended in the historical materialist view? Which is basically that history basically reveals hermeneutically the manner by which man is made in the image of God. We can't have a fixed image of man or a fixed image of God. The wealth of what God is, the density of what God is. Okay, but we believe in like apple. We have like a very apophatic theology, and one of the apophat, one of our sort of apophatic statements you could say, or like you know what God is not. It's like God uh, is not changed. Like God like isn't changing. God does not change. No, I'm not talking about God changing. I'm talking about our knowledge and our image of God changing, or not so changing. Well, we believe in like a, we changing. Believe in like hold on. Let me be clear. Okay. Not changing okay. because that's not teleological. It is striving toward the truth of the image and nature and, uh, of, of God in, in terms of our what knowledge. Is, sorry, I, what, what, is, what is striving towards that? Human history. Well, we, we have an idea that like, well, I guess our sort of the, our Christian or my, my Christian at least sort of view of that would be like, it's like, a, it's, we have like the, like the fathers, we have our saints, we have a tradition and we build it up more and more and more and we get sort of a better idea of like what sort of God is as yeah. time goes on that's like, tradition is about like preserving about what's eternal and we just add on to that uh sort of a whatever is eternal we just add on to that as the years go on so how is that different from historical materialism because we don't believe that to say like the the means of production as you define it can like are part of this change of our human nature or whatever that's the that's the question that i think really is is the point of disagreement why not why okay. isn't the way we actually reproduce ourselves how is that somehow not... Well, we, we just say that's not how we reproduce ourselves, though. No, I didn't say that's the only way. How is... Why do we exclude from this divine world? Why do we exclude this specific part of the way in which man reproduces himself? I mean, I guess you can, like... Talk, I mean, it's just... It's just not something that's ever like really talked about I, I, from from what I've You're read right. and from it, what it I've isn't. heard. It's not. It's just. It's just. So okay. So if you agree with me that it isn't, you can say that that's bad. That Christianity should do that. But no. the fact that you agree with it shows that it's not. No, I, I'm trying to say to that the that there is no final authority when it comes to what Christianity is on Earth. Uh, yes, there is, and it's called the the um the Orthodox Church. Yeah, but the church changes over time. So which I mean, the means adds on to eternity, which means eternity the final authority ways, like I don't really know like, we've had the, the final same authority is finite years. with regard to the future it, it can't predict the future sorry yeah I, I didn't hear that say the last part which means the final authority cannot predict the future which means it's finite which means there isn't really a final authority at all well we do believe that there is a final authority with like like God and that that's what we believe in and we believe that the church is sort of that mediator no, between man and God. No, but I said on earth. There's no final authority on what Christianity is on earth. Y yes, there is and it's the orthodox church. <laughs> yeah, but the truth of orthodoxy and the truth of the orthodox church is not complete. It's not complete, but it's not like it doesn't ever like contradict or change itself. I mean, you could say, "Oh yeah, we add a we, you know, we like, you know, new things are sort of like I don't want to say discovered, it, but new things. It doesn't sort necessarily of contradict new, like, itself, but it takes new yeah, no, form. A, it, it doesn't take new form. It's the same yes, thing. It, it does. just realizes itself if better. It didn't, if it didn't take new form, there would not be literal new forms decorating the uh, windows of Orthodox churches over any given you know, century. I mean, if you want to say, oh, we have like new, if you want to say, oh, we have like, you know, the amount of saints that we have now versus let's say like, you know, a thousand years ago, there's more saints. It's like, yeah, there's more saints, but we don't, we wouldn't consider that like changing Christianity or anything like that. I didn't say changing uh, Christianity. I never said that. Okay. Then what are you getting at? I'm just getting at the fact that you can't make assumptions about what Christianity means in the world. I, I don't, we, we don't we don't have there's no sort of like simulacrum for us about christianity means versus what christianity is we know what it is because we have the mediator of the church which is given us by god the church uh was pro-communist for a very long time i mean like not just pro-communist as it is today but was literally serving under the soviet state in the same way that it served under you know the the czars of the past and ivan the terrible and you know so I don't know what you're I mean, if you to want say. to talk about like if you want to talk about like symphony and like our sort of idea of what like church and state should be, 
I mean, we, we can do that. I don't know if that's what you're wanting to do per no, se. No, I'm, but I'm like, just trying to if, tell if, you. If the, church, if the church had its option, like they sort of like, I mean, they know that they sort of have to deal with the reality that they're given, not with the world that they want. And if that means like, you know, making peace with like regimes they don't like, then, you know, they'll do that from time to time. But okay. if they had a choice, but they would not have again, like, just, you know, again, or we're, any we're, other. We're, we have to go back to the initial question though, right? Why is it? that Christianity is incompatible with communism. You didn't give me an answer. All you've told me is that you don't think Christianity changes. I didn't say it changes. All I said is the manner by which we access Christianity takes new forms, which you seem to agree with in a sense. No. But, so there still how, seems how to I, be this... I mean, like, I mean, I don't like... I, I can, you I see like the, I let, see, uh, I let him go, Mantilla. So I think fundamentally here, it has to do with the hierarchy of narratives. And, you, and if you are a hardcore dogmatic Marxist, you cannot reconcile that with the Bible. You could probably adopt something that's akin to liberation theology, and you can borrow a lot from you said Marx a hierarchy in terms of, of Mar Marians narratives. Narratives. Okay. What narratives. What do you mean by that? So basically, what the Bible purports to be is a uh, you could say in one way a depiction of morality, a depiction of the human condition, and even furthermore, a depiction of history, where we came from and where we're going. It's divine revelation. You take it or you leave it. This is what's going to be driving history, especially so when you get what to about, prophetic uh, prophetic books like Isaiah and Revelations. So you and don't think there's a necessary hermeneutic at play in being able to interpret all of those things? No, I do. In fact, that's actually something that I that a light bulb kind of went off for me because there is a necessary um, apophatic, cataphatic, apophatic cycle to understanding what the divinity is, which is why in many ways... There, the the project of being the best Christian you can be is in some ways an infinite one because how exactly do you really attain theosis with God until you just it happens until you get like the the mystical experience that Saint Aquinas did where all the writings that he ever did in his life felt like straw compared to what was revealed to him supposedly we'll never know what he experienced but so this why is, is the that, kind of experience that people have why is that incompatible with Marxism. As because long as there's Marx a discontinuity between the text and the manner of interpretation, which you just acknowledged, I don't see why there has to be a, a disagreement with Marxism. Well, first of all, because Marx believes that man creates religion, not religion creates man. So it's a it's it's deprioritizing the importance of the biblical narrative, where from that starts with a history that starts from creation and goes all the way to the end of Revelations. Well, two so, things. Marx was um, paraphrasing Feuerbach, but also, don't you think that if man is made in the image of God, then man does create religion? No. Um, so that, that's just outright like a heresy to say something like that. Like, no, I'm not going to, no. So did, are you saying God physically wrote the Bible? In a way, in, in, in a way that matters, yes. So God literally came down to earth and in, in a way that matters, God wrote the Bible through divine he spoke through his prophets. Yeah, through like this sort of like yeah, I, I agree with the idea of <laughs> yeah. revelation, but it's still man who's making the religion. But so, for so us, though, it goes back to the sort of like hierarchy of narratives, though, where it's for us, it's, it's not important about what specific you know Jewish scribe wrote down, like you know whatever book in the Bible. Like that's just not important for us. Yeah, that but, narrative but, this, important, but there are a lot of important, important, important things narrative. like the rites, rituals, customs, culture, aesthetic, traditions, all things created by men. Now you can say that they were inspired by something divine. You could say that they were based on revelation, and I wouldn't contradict you, but man does create religion. I mean, if, if No, it, because, it, because the religion was created through the church, which God created. No, man creates the church under the direction of God. No, God, God created the God created the church. I mean, I mean, this isn't like something that we should have to be talking about. It's like kind of basic Christian doctrine here. Do you believe Islam is man-made? Uh, all religions are man-made. Okay, by saying that, you're going against like what our basic Christian like you know dogmas are, and in that way, Marxism. Yeah, is not I think you're you're confusing what I'm saying because I'm not saying that they originated in mere man, but ultimately, it is men and women that 
give form. Okay, so now we're going back to the question of like narratives, right? And this kind of goes back to what um, M was saying here about for Christianity, when we read the Bible, it's not just another story that we're reading. It is the story of stories. So, and so when you're, Marxism, you're, Marxism for us becomes idolatrous yeah. because it says that the Marxist narrative is almost on par or even more important than the Christian narrative. So you're actually just putting words in my mouth. I didn't actually say that religions are just another story and it's just man-made. I said, yeah, you can say they have divine inspiration and they're based ultimately on divine revelation. But it is people on earth who are practicing and giving form and giving expression to what the religion is. Yes, of course, you need people for a religion. Like that's No one's doubting that. Okay, so man, in a way, man does make religion. I mean, if you want to define it in that very like specific way, in the sense that you know people are needed to make religion, I mean, I, then I, I guess, yeah, if we use that definition, but that's not the definition I, I was and using. And then you that. also the said that man is made in the image of God. Did you not? Yeah, I did. So what man does is not separated from the divine. Okay. So I don't see why Marxist humanism is so incompatible with Christianity. Zoltanis, you want to say something? Uh, <clears throat> forget on this topic, I think Facifist would probably be a pretty good speaker, but he, he's muted right now. No, I'm here. I'm listening. I just don't want to interrupt because there's five people here. Is there anything but, you want to say? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that um, not, not specifically focusing on Marx here, but humanism in general. Humanism denies divinity outright. Um, Humanism as a philosophy basically puts forth the idea that this existence, this material existence is the highest form of, of existence that there is. And it basically subordinates any other concept of a transcendent existence underneath that uh, human experience in this material world. Now, again, this is not talking about Marx, but this is humanist ideas in general. I mean, I think Ganon had a pretty um, good definition so, of humanism, um, that which denies any principle above I humanity. I think it's called... Oration on the Dignity of Man, that's what it's called. So this work, Oration on the Dignity of Man, was made by a, a religious person during the Renaissance and is basically talking about the fact that humanism has nothing to do with replacing God with man. It has to do with recognizing Adam and man as the finest and most supreme of God's creation. You yourself said that Man is made in the image of God. So the question is, how can we come to know man? Well, developing our ability to cultivate an ability to know our own humanity is what humanism is. So no, that is not inherently, uh, in, uh, it's not inherently. Um, uh, well, if you say thing. something like this, though, it's like you really have to deny the sort of um, um, the, the power of God in a way, because you're saying that we need all these. Um, because if you read, for instance, like if you just read like, um, you know, the, the, the Bible, I mean, it's very clear. It's, it's this idea that, you know, God is like truth himself. Like God is logos. Jesus is the, the yeah, logos incarnate. Listen, I think you're not really understanding that God is not out of the picture and what I'm saying. The process by which we come to know ourselves, humanity that is not something somehow God is absent from because God is the source. That's the creator. And we're, this is just the creation developing and unfolding in the way God intended it to. So for you to say that this, this, is, um, this is somehow saying that like, oh, that's, that's somehow undervaluing the idea that God is the truth and God is the logos. No, the question is, in the same way that we're not born on earth knowing, for example, you know, um, we don't know when we're like a baby, for example, like that a snake is dangerous or that a fucking tiger will eat us or some shit. We have to figure things out. We don't just come equipped with knowing everything in the world. We also don't come equipped with the ability to know ourselves, right? We, we have to learn how to farm. We have to learn how to cook. We have to learn how to, you know, um, do everything pretty much, right? So why are you trying to say that if we don't know our own humanity, that means... I'm saying that, you know, that that uh, God has no privileged significance. Well, God gave us a church, not the Communist Manifesto, to understand who we are. Yeah, you're right. But God also didn't give us... Well, actually, saying God didn't give us the Communist Manifesto, I mean, it's kind of heretical. But 
regardless, we don't have to go down that. But um, God, uh, by your definition, God also didn't give us plumbing. He also didn't give us electricity. He also didn't give us, you know, the ability to hunt and farm and feed ourselves. And well, what and, I mean is like, I mean, I mean, and this kind of goes like you're kind of going to like sort of what like um, a lot of Muslims do about like the idea. They'll say, like, oh, like you know, you believe that God is everywhere. So do you when you go to the restroom, do you pee on your God? I mean, that's what you're kind of doing here. No, I'm, I'm not doing that. I'm trying to tell you that um, God does not give us, in this strict sense of practical, worldly knowledge, knowledge of ourselves. He gives us a kind of abstract, um, let's call it uh, revelatory knowledge of ourself, but coming to understand through the practical hermeneutic how this is true and the form of its truth is not something we know. We don't know how it's true. We know it's true that the Bible's correct and yada, yada, yada. We just don't know how specifically. How it's true is because God created it and God is like the logos and God is we, God. We have no understanding of what that is. That's why we Only have through exhausting our human capabilities and potentials, which were God given according to you. And we are literally made in the image of God. Could we come to some kind of awareness of how what you just said could be true? So, are you saying that like before, like con so you're saying when like Jesus was given his ministry, let's say that those people they had no way of really understanding him because they didn't have like a dialectical like a historical. No, it, it, they they, under understand they him? understood like, him. That would have to be your conclusion. They understood him in a religious sense. But, for example, what that means for human history, no, they couldn't have predicted that. They didn't know. They didn't know, for example, that, you know, Joe Biden was going to be the 46th president of the United States and yada, yada, yada. So they didn't know that. But they, they knew these core fundamental forms of knowledge that are strictly religious. They did not know how that would what do you come mean to strictly? Be. What do you mean strictly religious? In what sense? What does that mean? I mean, like doctrinal and containing the wisdom through the text itself. Um, basically, but this seems like you're almost like doing like the sort of like Hegelian and sort of like modernistic bourgeois thing, where like you put like philosophy above theology no, or something not. like that. No, I think theology is above philosophy. Then why okay. do you have dialectical materialism? If dialectical the materialism a, is. Dialectical materialism is 100% anti-philosophical from the beginning. How can it be anti-philosophical? Um, because philosophy begins and ends with the idea. and also begins and ends with the logos of Heraclitus, right? Not the logos of theology, but the logos of Heraclitus rendered into the form of the Platonic idea. So philosophy basically is just trying to find how the idea or the logos is consistent. That's the goal of philosophy, the consistency of thought in the form of the idea. And dialectical materialism rejects that in favor of something I actually think is closer to religion, which is basically recognizing the consistency of a more divine, intuitive, and then I would say myself, material logos. And material just in the strict sense that it doesn't conform to any finite form of thought, which is what philosophy is. Marx is very clear about that. Marx is very clear about the fact that materialist dialectics necessarily require this openness to the unknown as a founding principle that we do not inherently know the world outside of us. So philosophy, I think, is actually inherently satanic. Philosophy is trying to know uh, the ultimate secret of creation and divinity, trying to know God uh, through the mind, and therefore replace God, and therefore create an artificial God. Um, that is completely... Uh, well, how do, you, how do you suppose that we know God if not through our minds? Uh, through faith, through intuition, through feeling, through belief. I guess we're just using, like, how are you using the word mind here? Like, do you mean like some like sort of like rational, like some like sort of like... I mean it in terms system. of certainty, like a Cartesian certainty that I think, therefore I am. Or the, even the platonic certainty, the certainty of the consistency of the form of the idea. Yeah, I think he's conflating mind with gnosis. I think that's what he's doing. I, I think I'm okay, beginning to understand it. it. I think I'm beginning to understand what he means, actually. No, I mean mind. 
Yeah. Do we want to move on to a different topic here? I think we kind of exhausted this. I actually don't because um, I okay. think to, to advocate that dialectical materialism is anti-philosophical in itself is a philosophical statement. You have to justify why dialectical materialism is the appropriate analysis of of, of history and why historical materialism but, is yeah, but a Marxists more have demonstrated to that Marxists the, have the demonstrated than the Bible. Yeah, but Marxists have demonstrated that with Stalin. They didn't demonstrate it with philosophy. They demonstrated it with the October Revolution and the Great Patriotic War. And that's how they've justified. They haven't justified it. Philosophy. They've justified it through belief, faith. The Soviet Union didn't last more than it didn't even last a century. It collapsed. And it collapsed, it's the collapse began pretty quickly after Stalin's demise. So you're right. at some point, you're right, if, but, if, the, um, if, you're, if you're arguing that the proof is in the pudding, we'll just have to see what actually works. Well, the Soviet Union collapsed. And even then, like if we want to talk about phil underlying philosophical you know, presuppositions, the hidden idealism, which I, many people in this chat room have um, analyzed to death with latent within uh, Marx's um, writings in the 1940s, like the German ideology, that was that was so that was so scandalous to many Soviet academics that they tried to fabricate passages within these these hidden um, Marxist texts that were unpublished unpublished so they could you try have, to uh, uh, evidence for materialism. that. Yeah, I think um, I'm Stila and Nevesky, um Yeah, so there's like um, when the Soviet Union with um, I forgot his name George David Razanov I think was yeah, one of David, the fabrication. Yeah. Yeah, oh, in the Marx Engels Lenin Institute, I think it was called like MIGA or something like that. He wrote this chapter in, um, I think, 1844 manuscripts. Fierbach I, I think. Yeah, like, yeah, something like that. Okay, and then even like, give me, give me a link to the Soviets uh, okay. fabricating passages. But in the meantime, you said the Soviet Union didn't last more than a century, which is true. But the consequences of the October Revolution and the Soviet Union's existence were irreversible. It's defining Russia's predicament today. It has not gotten over the end of the Soviet Union by any means. Neither has Eastern Europe, for that matter. The mode of production has been irreversibly altered by Soviet communism. And then finally, its most lasting impact is, of course, China, which has transformed the entire world and which is the leading, you know, premier power of humanity today, right? It represents the future of all humanity. That comes from the Soviet Union. That's all from that. All right, so then let me extend the, the lens even further. In what ways did the geopolitical interests of the Soviet Union differ from its predecessor, the Russian Empire, besides a new, a new ideological need to, uh, to spread communism worldwide, at least, at least for a little while before socialism in one country became the norm? The geopolitical interests of the Soviet Union extended throughout the globe. That's the difference. The Russian Empire confined itself to its immediate geography or Central Asia um, and, you know, Europe. But the Soviet Union was geopolitically a bipolar power, along with the United States, that was basically competing for the entire world. Is it to spread ideology or to secure the immediate interests of Russia? Or you could say, or you know, um, Soviet it's Union? Both, it was both, was more immediate. or less. Both the anti-imperialist, well, it depends on what time period, the anti-imperialist stance of the Soviet Union to the point where, you know, it's funding Ethiopia and it's giving arms to Spain in the Civil War and it's doing all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, that is kind of part of that inner, that need for the Soviet Union to kind of um, not spread the revolution, but gain international allies in the international community. Um, you know, which is also part of spreading the ideology, which is something they did. They educated, they brought people from all over the former colonial world to be educated in Moscow, to be educated in the ideas of Marxism, and Marxism, Leninism, which they did take back home. I mean, uh, everyone in the Middle East who's involved in politics knows an uncle or two trained in Moscow. But then, you know, after, um, after I would, I would say after Stalin, you know, the kind of question of self-interest versus ideology. Well, I think there's a third element beyond self-interest and ideology, which is this kind of new global kind of managerial class uh, that was kind of emerging in contradictions to China. That was kind of what was going on with the Sino-Soviet split. You had this global kind of academicized managerial class, somewhat kind of even allied with the Democratic Party in America and the Social Democrats in Europe. And they were kind of all forming this alliance 
in a lot of ways, which was being challenged by China during that communist civil war. So, I mean, it just depends on the time period, but more or less, yeah, the geopolitical interests definitely changed since after the Tsar's times. Was the Soviet Union able to sustain those geopolitical interests abroad beyond its immediate borders? Um, it depends. What do you mean? Well, were these were these burdensome in any way? I mean, the, the fact that the Soviet Union always had a difficulty in projecting power um, beyond its borders. I don't think it did. I think geography. after World War II, about twenty five percent of the world's population were living under communist states. So I think that's pretty. Uh, he posted one of the links in the uh, private chat. By the way, Hoss. Okay. It's more than just it's more than just what percentage. It's also about the nature of where they were, which is the fact that the Soviet Union was. I mean, if you just we can do a tour of the geography. What were its what were its outlets to the outside world? You had the Baltic Sea, which was closed off to by Germany and in Scandinavia, which was hostile to the, the Soviet Union. You had the Arctic Ocean, which was you know it's bounded by ice most of the time it's not a valuable it's not a, it's not a valuable or reliable trade route you have vladivostok which in itself was it's also not a it's not ice free year round it's not a great place to project power it's better than nothing but there's a reason why the russian empire really wanted port arthur in china and then of course you had china which as you were pointing out the sino soviet split was not a reliable ally so you have you have all these limiting geopolitical concerns that made it very difficult for the Soviet Union to project power to sustain. Well, its I, I don't know. I, I think. Um, and they're very expensive to do so as well. The and Soviet Union definitely didn't have the. the uh, yeah. It didn't. It definitely didn't have the maritime strength of the United States, which was a definite disadvantage. But I mean, at the same time, I don't see what what the point of what you're trying to say is. It was very successful in being able to project the soft power. I think the primary. Um, thing the Soviet Union was able to project in terms of power was a combination of education. It was one of the biggest destinations for former colonized and even colonized countries, uh, the people there to get an education. It was arms, obviously, the providing of arms, the formation of economic relationships, the establishment of a kind of global communist, socialist economic community, which, you know, gave incentives to people to join the socialist bloc. I think all these things represent, uh, you know, a pretty successful ability to project. I mean, I don't know what, like, compared to what? Compared to the United States, it was not as successful, obviously, but compared to literally any other country, it, it was safe for China today, which is doing better than both the United States and the Soviet Union. I mean, in that sense, it kind of demonstrates that regardless of whether the, the Communist Revolution was initially successful in, in Russia, Russia could not be the seat of the revolution worldwide. It simply was not in the right location at the right time. And the fact that it collapsed under um, under both its internal contradictions and economic pressure worldwide from, from its enemies demonstrates that it was not the real deal. So if we're trying to talk about if does his, did history prove communism right, at the very least, it did not prove the Soviet Union right. And arguably well, speaking... It's, I it's, think we're, we haven't gotten to the point whether we should talk about about whether we should be looking at historical materialism as the framework in which we use history, or the Bible in which we use the framework to understand history. And neither of these things can be true. One of them has to be um, higher than the other in the hierarchy of narratives that we that we described earlier. So if you're going to be like, I, I actually highly respect what you're trying to do here. I just think that there are some latent contradictions that you haven't resolved when it comes to um, what exactly the end goal is. And I think you're trying to re re revise Marx to be something that he's not. Well, Do you think that Marxist theory should be on the same level as religion? Uh, I'll, I'll answer that after this. I want to do one at okay. a time. So you said that the Soviet Union, um, it, was not, it was not successful for the Soviet Union historically. But I also think you're undercutting the significance of the Sino-Soviet split as also a kind of civil potential civil war within the Soviet Union. Um, see, what the people did after Stalin, which was this kind of bureaucracy uh, that grew during the 30s and even some remnants from the 20s, to save their own skin and prevent being purged and, and have Stalin's further kind of democratizing reforms. By democratizing, by the way, I just mean like give the Russian state Sorry, give the Soviet state more of a character reflecting the kind of Russian peasant, right? So Stalin is kind of like a populist sense. 
I think um, there was a very broad potential within the Soviet Union for the kind of reform that happened in China that was able to save China. I think this idea of a seat of revolution, yeah, there, there was a lot of things about the Soviet Union's geopolitical stance with regard to the world that were, was very difficult. But I think the Sino-Soviet split was the decisive factor. I don't think that was just because China was unreliable. I think it has a lot to do with an internal contradiction within communism that Mao gives theorization to in the form of the persistence of the class struggle under socialism. So I think, you know, if, if Mao prevailed in the Soviet Union, so to speak, I don't think there would have been a collapse. And I think, you know, Zayuganov has acknowledged that. I think Putin has also acknowledged that before, that had we gone down the path of China, we would have been saved. So, you know, there's that. And then also, um, I don't see a contradiction. Now, this kind of, the second thing you said is also related to what Zolt is asking, is do I put Marx as a higher authority than the Bible? Um, in my personal life... Not necessarily higher, but like on an equal footing with it. Well, it, it depends. Is man, on an, is man made in the image of God? Is man put on an equal footing with, you know... Um, well, I didn't want to clarify. The reason why I am asking this is because there was an attempt within the Third Reich by people like Rosenberg to put Mein Kampf on the same level as the Bible, and it's it's very very heretical, and uh, no, I'm, that's why I'm that asking sense. this question. No, no, no. I I don't think Marxism can replace religion. Absolutely not. Marxism confines itself very specifically um, to I I don't I don't like. I find the distinction kind of problematic, but to the secular world, it confines itself to the world of humanity in terms of these kinds of like ancient wisdoms about the divine, you cannot replace religion. I, I would also go as far as to say that Marxism presupposes uh, the Abrahamic religions. There's, it's not thinkable and it doesn't make any sense without them. So in a way that most Marxists didn't appreciate, and I'll admit this, not even the uh, uh, Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, even, I mean, Mao, even they weren't really cognizant. I think Stalin eventually became cognizant of the fact. But the rest were kind of just, it's not that they denied it, but they just never concerned themselves with this fact. But that the living flame of religious traditions provided the very context for Marxism to even be meaningful. Without those hundreds of millions of people across the world keeping this flame alive through practices that from a narrow kind of secular vulgar perspective appear meaningless and superstitious that was actually reproducing the very framework within which the meaningfulness of marxism can be derived so i think a new attitude definitely toward religion is necessary i just don't think that's a revising of marx i think it's rather an exploration of something that Marxists did not give proper attention to, you know, it's not that they were giving attention to it and they just denied it. They barely gave any attention to that. They almost exclusively focused on, you know, combating the political enemies that were within the church. Um, but beyond that, I mean, it's kind of an open door. It's kind of knocking on an open door. Were, so, the, were the old believers political enemies then? Um, they were enemies of the Orthodox Church. Okay, Even but today. they like, they were still like a, a non threatening sect that basically they're basically like monks and a lot of them died under the Soviet Union. Uh what what years were they persecuted the most heavily? Anti your uh, the anti God plan. So the anti religious campaigns were you have to understand the, not the entire Soviet state was under a single will. Okay, there were a lot of elements within the Soviet state that basically rep recognized this westernized and overly urbanized fanaticism of either young people or even class uh, enemies of the majority of the Soviet people who would basically use Marxist ideology as a way to preserve their superior position over the masses. So in a lot of ways, these anti-religious campaigns came to represent that faction that was within the Soviet state, which was hostile to the reforms and the changes Stalin was uh, overseeing. So Stalin kind of represents the you know, great Russian majority 
And there's this kind of tit for tat implicit struggle going on between people who are, even during collectivization, the same thing happened, right? It wasn't Stalin's intention for the kind of acts of these criminal acts of um, repression against ordinary peasants to occur during collectivization. But class enemies within the Soviet state used it as an opportunity to attack the Russian peasant. And actually speaks to the correctness of Mao's thesis of a class struggle under socialism. Actually, the same thing happened during the Cultural Revolution. At first, uh, these intellectuals and this intelligentsia that was overly urbanized went and terrorized Chinese peasants, you know, destroying all these old customs and traditions. But then immediately afterwards, you know, it was the tables were turned against them and the peasants started to actually realize that Mao was trying to get them to rise up. So this similar thing happened during collectivization, where in around 37, 38, during those great purges, the same people carrying out this level of extremism and repression against the traditional Russian peasant majority, those are the people who got, you know, sniped during the purges. And then very shortly afterwards, Stalin shuts down the uh, League of Militant Atheists and reopens the church even before World War II. What do you think about um, uh, Walter Benjamin's thesis on history? The theses on history. He's like last work before he killed himself. Have Are you, you talking about curious. his famous saying about the angel of history looking back? or What specific thesis? Uh, I, 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 Oh, no, I'm just saying in general, like his idea that he says like humans are um, like um, softly messianic or like slightly messianic. He has like some wording like that and how like there's, there's a sort of like messianic aspect to like Marxism that a lot yeah, of people sort of deny. Um, I definitely like Walter Benjamin way better than anybody else in the so-called Frankfurt School. Actually, I think he's the only one I somewhat sympathize sure, with. Yeah. But I do think there are theological limitations there but i broadly sympathize what do you mean like theological limitations to what he's saying or like what he's saying yeah because uh, i think while marxism is abrahamic i think there's also a unique significance of the relationship between christianity and marxism leninism where i think well, benjamin is just and i'm not maybe he's not wrong but he is more kind of exploring the relation of Judaism and Kabbalah to a more classic. Yeah, because he was really into like mystic Jewish mysticism yeah, and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, precisely. But and I take him all and a couple other things. Yeah, especially. there there's an implicit thing where it's like Marxism Leninism is kind of uh, the Christian step, right? And then classical Marxism is kind of more within, and it's not necessarily they're in contradiction. It's just that they're different. Um, Different orientations. Like classical Marxism is like the Old Testament, like in like yeah, MLS that's what like that's Testament. exactly it. <laughs> okay, okay. And, and Stalin actually kind of hints at this when he's polemicizing with Marxists within the Soviet Union, and he's saying, you know, he he, it's not an anti-Semitic dog whistle because he's not talking about Jews; he's just talking about a specific theological orientation. He calls them the Talmudists, who are interpreting the text of uh, Marx within a kind of narrow textualistic framework. Yeah, and, I don't, I don't buy the idea that like Stalin was like anti-Semitic. I mean, didn't he like outlaw anti-Semitism? Yeah, I, I, there's not really any evidence he was. And like, uh, and like the proof, it's like it only comes because he purged a bunch of Trotskyites, and they just <laughs> happened to be Jewish. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, there were a lot of actually uh, Jewish Stalinists who remained loyal to Stalin. As well, but pacifist. But. but there. Uh, I think broadly the 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 thing that was never compatible with Marxism was the paganism. That was something that, you know, that gets a revival around the 60s and 70s, but those are mostly by or almost exclusively. What are you talking about paganism? What do you mean? Like what um, are you referring to? I mean it in the sense of theosophy and even oh. some of the things Dugan used to be interested in. You know, in the yeah. 80s and 90s. Crowley boy. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, you know, those um, affiliates, the circles that he was in, that was always received very harshly from the Stalinist Soviet state. Um, well, a lot of it's just like, it's just like, you know, the, the sons and daughters of like the bourgeoisie with too much money are able yeah. to start their own like, you know, communes and just like, you know, try to have like these sex cults and whatnot. Yeah, and within the Soviet Union during the 60s and 70s, it was the sons and daughters of the Soviet establishment, actually, that were um, 
trying to bring the hippie movement to the Soviet Union. It was, it was the Soviet establishment. And Dugan's, I mean, Dugan himself was the son of, a, uh, of an intelligence officer. And he, maybe he would fit within that category in his youth. But he, he also recognized, you know, that the staunchest, um, you know, representatives of the Soviet establishment went on to become the most anti-Soviet uh, ideologists after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So he noticed that connection. I know like Aleister Crowley, I think he came from a really rich family. And there's a couple others I can, that can pop up in my mind and whatnot. Yeah. Fast, fast, you there? Yeah, okay, I'm here. What's up? Okay, sweet. Uh, if we roll it back down to like the, the, the church, like Soviet relations, uh, I think you know a lot about that stuff, right, Festivus? Yeah, I know a few things, yeah. Yeah, I'll just let you talk then. I mean, what Haas has said regarding the history between the relations between um, the church and the state, uh, that is true. I think there was something I wanted to say, but I didn't want to interrupt, and that was namely that within church teaching, um, traditionally, it's very clear that the church seeks to, uh, of course, obey with the government that is already there that's ruling. So, for example, if you take a look at <clears throat> the Roman times, um, Jesus is pretty clear, render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar and unto God what belongs to God. And then Paul, again, in First Peter 2 and other areas, he talks about, um, sorry, I should say Peter, I misspoke there, not Paul. But Paul also in Romans 13 talks about, you know, uh, giving honor to the uh, governing authorities, the civil authorities, et cetera, et cetera. So what I mean to say is that it's not specifically that the church approves or disapproves of communism per se, more so than it seeks to be at peace with the state that's there. In this case, it's the Soviet Union. Before that, it was the, the uh, Russian Empire. And today it would be the Russian Federation. So it's not so much about the ideology or the worldview more so than the apparatus of the state and the governing authorities that are in the state, regardless of whether they're communists or not, whether they're monarchists or not, doesn't matter. That's one thing I wanted to say, because I do remember Haas saying that um, they were okay with communism. I don't think it was so much that they were okay with communism as they were okay with the Soviet Union. I think there is a distinction there. Well, I think something that speaks to that, sorry, speaks to the um, uh, one of the unique achievements of Christianity history is the fact that while Christianity says render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, it also gives the kind of, um, how do I put it? It gives the kind of, um, I'll call it metaphysical very loosely, the metaphysical um, tools in order to understand contradictions within Caesar, right? It's not that the Christianity does reject the view that we, because of our arrogance, are just going to overthrow a state based on our will or based on our specific that's definitely something that is rejected within christianity but christianity's dialectic also allows you to perceive the contradictions that are within the state itself and so render unto caesar in a sense can be revolutionary when it is that Caesar himself is at odds with himself, when the state somehow has an internal inconsistency. What I think is relevant about that today, is this is what I wanted to get to, is that today the Orthodox Church, while it does side with the Putin government broadly, especially when it comes to the military operation in Ukraine, um, it also recognizes the contradictions within the Russian state and it firmly sides with the Communist Party and is in a coalition with the Communist Party, um, which is, again, the largest opposition party within the um, Russian Federation. It's a legal party, so it's not violating the law. Um, but it does represent a faction, the strongest faction that is in opposition to the kind of westernizing liberals who want to um, destroy Russian culture. And this is something that has united both the communists and the, the Orthodox Church because both of them don't want Western liber liberalism and its madness to destroy Soviet culture and, sorry, to destroy Russian culture and uh, you know, Russian traditions. Yeah, I don't have anything to say to that because that is uh, something that I've also noticed about um self-professed communists from russia is that they think in that direction as well they are very um patriotic and, and 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 i guess conservative in that sense but i don't again i don't i wouldn't say it's necessarily because they're communists but more so because they're russian 
Right, but this is also starting to reflect elsewhere in the world, right? The it's starting to become the norm, I would say, for communist parties to there's basically two factions, and this was true at the end of the Soviet Union when it comes to the communist parties of the world today. There's the globalist Soros faction, which is aligned with the NGOs and it's aligned with American unipolar interests, which is, you know, that that is something that is starting to gain ground and gain strength specifically in the West, but it is spreading out. I mean, Chile with that Boric guy, the shill of uh, America, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's other examples. But so there's basically these two factions in the international communist uh, world, I would put it. And the other one is firmly patriotic, and I would argue traditionalist, and it's, and, and, you know, firmly based and rooted in the specific countries of context. So... I, you know, it, as far as that's concerned, I think for uh, communism throughout the entire world, there's just a choice between two possibilities. Um, and, and, and you, uh, just out of curiosity, you consider Castro to be a genuine communist, right? Castro? Yeah. Um, that's, that, I mean, I guess, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so from that perspective, I can understand your position and why you would say that. Yeah, um, obviously, some of the guys here, including myself, are a little iffy on him being a genuine communist. We think that that would definitely apply more so to his brother Raul, but not Fidel himself. Uh, we think Fidel was more of a of a Cuban nationalist, um, and he w he thought more geopolitically than ideologically. Is is the way we view? We view I don't. I don't think that's necessarily in contradiction to communism though i do know you know he 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 started out just as a you know, nationalist uh, revolution but right. fun my... fact uh he actually got visited by the authentic falange when franco was alive and they actually gave him roman salutes it's caught in a photo then they gave him a copy of jose antonio's uh selected yeah, writings i know of... uh castro was uh, that's what i heard he was implicitly friendly with franco they actually put the Jose Antonio selected writings that he was gifted inside the uh, yeah one of the museums in Habana. Yep. That's yeah, right. yeah, I, I did hear about that. But my disagreements with Castro mainly come from his stance during the Sino-Soviet split, um, and that's where I mean, be, I mean, that's not how I define the guy. He was obviously a great person and a great leader, but you know, I, I don't consider him on at a theoretical level to be up there with you know Stalin, and Mao, and, and the rest of those. So, and I also consider Che have a position in politics, you know, that was more correct than Castro. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually intrigued you, that you, um, sorry, continue. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I can save it for later. I was actually intrigued and I actually agree with you about a hundred percent that there are two schools of, um, communist thought, especially today. And I actually would return to Plato to understand the differences a bit. You have one that is more supportive of, you could say, Western liberalism in the sense that that's, what, that's where they align themselves morally. This is like the, the epitumia side of, um, the, like the desirous, the libidinal side of the soul. That those communists align with the West. But then there's the, 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 there's the masculine, the thematic, the passionate side of the soul that aligns itself in another school, which I, I see more in you. And this is actually where I find a indeterminate um, moral system with, laden within Marxism. And this is why I often call it a um, ultimate liberalism in a sense, because Marxist main criticism of, of the political liberalism of his time is that it did not go far enough in that if, if, his, if history is driven by material concerns, starting with the need to escape the necessities imposed on us by nature, the fact that we have to hunt for a living, hunt and gather for a living and escape the elements, only then to find ourselves trapped within social bonds because the modes of production also then create new superstructures which ensnare us, forcing us to try to get to the end of history where we will eventually have such a sophisticated um, amount of technology that we could do away with necessity completely if only we were to seize the means of production there is a there is a there is a uh, both a liberalism and illiberalism here 
the liberal the liberalism is in the end goal which is to have the communist utopia where you can finally realize a complete personality where where man's productive essence can be realized to create as he wishes to realize that end of mankind but to get there is the liberal side and i think this is where you find the distinction between the two communists you have people like vouch who are attracted to just not having necessity no struggle nothing and these people will al al align themselves with the west because they think because the west already is kind of post necessity which is why you can have people buying funko pops and uh and, and wasting thousands of dollars on marijuana and only fans they're basically just like your average telegram nazi yeah and then we've yeah. made these, of, um, these other LARPing third positions before. And people who are aligned to your brand of Marxist Leninism, these are the more thematic types. These are more, these are people who, I, I honestly would have to say, they probably like to struggle more than they like the end goal. So I think there's an indeterminate um, moral system laden within Marxism where the process is illiberal. But if the process were ever achieved, it would be a liberal par paradise. It would be subject to the same nihilistic concerns that afflict the West right now. So this is why we have a very anti-Marxist response, because it may get a lot of things right. Within Marxist dialectics, you may see a uh, an analogy for like the the, the theos, like the the cataphotic, then aphotic, apophotic uh, understanding of trying to achieve theosis, trying to achieve knowledge of God. But then it it says that we can get there on our own. I believe and, it's more of the uh, the Maoist element, actually. So I think your description of this idea of communism as the end goal is correct for the new left in the West, 100%. That is definitely, like, basically people who don't want to have a job and, yeah, the Walsh kinds. Yeah, that's all, the hippies, whatever. That's 100% correct. I just would say, though, I mean, just there are a few things. Beginning with Marx, Marx does talk about a level of you know wealth and prosperity that will no will no longer you know experience nature as a kind of oppressing reality we'll be able to have sufficient free time to give consideration to what marx calls the scientific and and aesthetic pursuits right and i would add also religious pursuits to that right but I don't think that's necessarily a, a utopia devoid of necessity. I think necessity is still driving the, um, the development of humanity and history, even during communism. It's just not a necessity that is brought to the threshold of you know, direct um, extinction through, uh, through hunger and through um, disease and, and things like that. Then I would also uh, say, to be fair, very quick, sorry, before I get to that, Marx did say that communism is only the real movement. It's not an end goal, not an ideal to which we can form society. Communism is nothing more than the real movement that sublates the present thing. So for Marx, communism is the struggle, right? It's just that that struggle for Marx, he predicts, will have consequences for the mode of production. The consequence being, um, you know, yeah, a level of, I wouldn't say post necessity, but, you know, a level isn't of. It like, isn't it supposed to be like the abolishment of the commodity form? The sublation of the commodity form. Yeah, Marx sure. thinks the commodity form, uh, the institution of private property, and when I say institution, I mean in the form of the state, will disappear um, or dissolve, right? Become something else. But you have to understand, these, this is a very dialectical process. Stalin wrote in one of his writings in the 40s. Uh, I think it was in the, I don't know, if, I don't know exactly when it was, 40s or 50s, that he said, dialectically speaking, we do believe the state will be sublated, which is why we must strengthen the state to the furthest possible level, um, because only then can it be, um, only then can the possibility of like it developing into its opposite, something like that occur, right? So um, this this is a thing of going through, you don't, get rid of it by just abolishing it. You go through the process. It's also what China's doing right now, right? With its, uh, you know, more, more market-oriented commodity where it's unleashing the forces of production. It's going through the process of um, what might be called before capitalism, right? And this is, China calls the socialism because 
not because it's an end goal of socialism, but because the process of the revolutionizing of the forces of production is what Marx defined as communism. But also, I want to make a point about this end goal. Kind of, to be fair, in the Soviet Union, not so much on an ideological level, but in, on an aesthetic, cultural, and unconscious ideological level, um, people did really think of communism as a utopia. They did think of it as like all of our problems, all of our strife, all of our suffering that we have now, we're building at this radiant communist future in order to um, kind of, you know, pass through the threshold and, and put an end to that. But, I mean, it's really clear the theological um, significance of that. I mean, on the one hand, it is man walking toward divinity, the embrace of divinity. And on the other level, it's, you know, the, it's, the, it's the paradise, right? Kind of Christian description of paradise. So I don't think that that Soviet utopia which was not theoretical. I'm not saying Soviet Marxist theorists were utopians, but I'm just saying like culturally, right? I don't think that was the same as the kind of idea of bum, bum communism that Western leftists like Walsh have. I think that was a more, even though it was a, maybe a naive view that all suffering and all that will disappear, it was very much spiritually charged. It had this kind of quality of, transcendence to it where like we couldn't even imagine what it would be like it's not that we're thinking oh it's going to be like degeneracy and there's going to be furries and sex uh polysules and, and all this kind of shit that's in abundance it's more so this kind of very spiritual vision of kind of transcending the worldly need of the material even just the material the colloquial sense of the word world right like uh we will become pure kind of angelic spiritual beings so that's one that's one disagree that's a few disagreements i have with that description but I, I do think it's true for the western left that that's how they view communism well i can understand why they view it that way because it's really hard to pick at any sort of moral prescriptions from marx ex except for the fact that you should play a role in history and that the goal of mankind is to achieve this pure liberty and not the faux historically determined liberty that the political liberals of his time were satisfied with. So when you remove necessity, what do you have left? And actually, this is, this is a very important question I have for you. What kind of necessities do you think would still be around that would still be meaningful as it not being satisfied by the most production of the day in the hands of the workers? when we reach the state of communism because sure. at that point you know you don't have to you don't have to uh worry about hunting or gathering or or going to a nine to five job to make ends meet or anything like that you, you just don't i think it's this just, is more of the know? malice uh malice element uh probably than than just like pure marxism but so i think um i think to, to answer that question right marx talks about so first, I kind of want to talk a little bit about morality, right, in general. So Marxism is not trying to create a new morality, right? So as far as your morality is concerned, that is going to come from a combination of mores, your intuitions, things that are created and prescribed by religions, you know? And it could even be religion itself, which is, I think, a more temporary view to have. The problematic of morality within Marxism only enters at the sphere of the political, actually. Uh, the moral dilemmas start to happen when it comes to like, okay, what is morally permissible for a revolution and for, you know, the state to do? I think that's where the kind of issues of morality enter Marxism. Otherwise, you know, you just kind of, you can have your morality come from the tradition, right? But I think Marxism is it's when it comes to the morality of a political agent and it comes to a morality of the participation in the state i think the basic idea is that must unfold and develop on its own terms you cannot betray the revolution in the name of morality you have to possess a fidelity to this process that's unfolding in history 
which is not being predicted by anyone, which is not being foreseen by anyone. But, you know, it's it's kind of like a matter of loyalty. Loyalty to um, the truth, almost hermeneutic, divine truth of revolution. Uh, something that's disclosed to us almost purely as a matter of faith, not based on any prior knowledge or moral construction. Um, I think I think in the statehood and in the history, right, our moral aesthetic is suspended in real time. We somehow have a moral instinct to guide us through these things that belongs to its own logic. And to finally get to your second point, Marx does not have an empiricist or individualistic view of uh, what constitutes a human being. For Marx, a human being is part of some kind of, let's call it a social whole or a historical whole or some kind of community, right? Um, so necessity will be based on the internal contradictions and internal necessity that defines man's relationship not only to nature, which Marx calls the development of the scientific uh, um, pursuit, but also the aesthetic, right? Which is going to be about how does man relate to the world of man, the community of man. So in that sense, necessity is also defined by um, possessing fidelity to the contradictions uh, of the state. Necessity will be defined by an internal necessity of our, of our non-given humanity. We as human beings, in other words, aren't just animals. We don't just exist as physical bodies and animals where our necessity is satisfied just by eating and shitting and whatever, right? We also have a specific way in which we define our humanity through the social whole. And that social whole is never complete. It's always historical, always undergoing a process of of, um, of uh, discovering itself, right? So uh, the key here is both the scientific and aesthetic pursuits, not just the scientific. That's how I would answer. Um, necessity also becomes about attending to the spiritual incompleteness uh, of the world of humanity. So... I want, to say really, I want to say really quick, after we get done talking like morals and ethics, uh, I do want to push this more back into Dugan after again. Well, yeah. I'll let you continue. Yeah. All right, so to address the first point regarding uh, Marx's supposed division of um, the ethical, which I could so would say with personal and the political, I'd argue that he doesn't do that. And he this is clearly pointed out on his essay on the Jewish question, where he not only uh, takes and where he not only somewhat agrees with Bauer's proposition that you can't just settle for religious freedom, which which gives people the right to be individuals who in, in, internally hold value, values that are different from everybody else. So like within this framework of negative rights, I do, I do myself, like I do me, you do you, and we're just supposed to not collide into each other. Marx is, Bauer's against that because that, 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 that is a separation uh that's a, that get, that's a barrier to um discovering the underlying humanity that unites us all so he sees that as a barrier with marx jumping in afterwards to point out that even if you abolish religion too all these things that make us different and you abolish this negative rights framework too you still have the material uh impacts left like the echoes from the for that that, the, that were built on top of that the ideologies were built on top of so this is both uh, a uh, a rejection of one that Marx saw religion as compatible with uh, dialectical materialism when he th thought it was it's something that should be uh, that something that should be at least um, destroyed if not to be rebuilt later, but also the idea that the ethical and the political are separate. No, they're really not. And this is actually an idea that goes all the way back to Plato. If you look at the idea, his definition of justice too. He talks about justice in the city and justice in the soul. And really, it's about, and, and the, the definition of justice is about knowing your place within the greater framework. So understanding your position in a system that stretches from the very top, like the, the, the height of society and who's in control of society, to the very bottom, the workers, 
Like, what, what do they do to contribute? And everyone in the middle. That is that is the, that is basically what Marx is holding is a platonic understanding of ethics and politics, which is that they're basically the same thing. It's justice. It's about what do you do in the personal life and what everyone's doing collectively, and that they should all be in unison somehow in harmony. Now to um, bring upon to the second point, I don't understand what you mean by that we have to now deal with internal contradictions when we reach the state of communism, because it was under my understanding that communism is what happens when class divisions dissolve. If we still have internal contradictions to deal with, then I think Rousseau and Nietzsche get very interesting here because Rousseau argues that before property, before you know, property and like economic inequality come into play, you first have social inequality that happens in his history of mankind from, you know, you know, we started off as savages, then we kind of discuss, got a little bit smarter and discovered the family, then we got a little bit smarter and we discovered tribes. And then when we hit tribes is when Rousseau goes, discover social inequality, because there's always going to be a popularity contest among humans. One person's going to be on top and other people are not going to be as popular. And inevitably, that one person is going to have aims and he's going to direct society, and he's going to want to protect what he got. And this is where property comes into play. If Marx cannot resolve the problem of social inequality, even after class contradictions are abolished, then the whole point of Marxism doesn't even make any sense, because all you'd be basically doing is rewinding back the clock to the point where we have maybe some sort of um, temporary piece of uh, social equality, until some Nietzschean dude comes in and wins everyone else's affection or just dominates everybody. And then all of a sudden we're now back into the property rat race because someone will want to get their gains, preserve their gains, and then perpetuate those gains through property. So if communism doesn't actually get us to the promised land where none of these contradictions have to be worried about economic or social or whatever, then it's problematic. And the only, the only narrative that actually tries to do that beyond class contradictions, because it's not just about collective, um, a collective unit, but also on an individual level, like what is what is within the soul, then you don't have a system that actually works. Your promised land doesn't make sense. And that's where the Bible comes in. And you have a reconciliation of the individual and the collective and theosis with God. In fact, I, I would, if, if you wanted me to like, just can you keep going further, if you really trace back the, um, ide the, the genealogy of ideas of Marx, Marx got his ideas from Hegel, Hegel got his ideas from, from, a, from Christian occultism and hermeticism, which, ought, which goes all the way back to, um, back to uh, like Christian apocalyptic thinkers like uh, jo uh, Joachim of Fiore. All these people, what they were basically trying to do was to take the historical timeline and accelerate it through a apophatic, cataphatic, apophatic process, which is basically like Hegelian dialectics. You got the abstract, then you got the negation, then you got the concrete, which then Marx takes and appropriates for dialectical materialism, and then creates his own secular version of revelations, the biblical timeline for the future. So, With, so like it's basically this is the problem here. There, Mar Marx is not an all-encompassing narrative that can actually get you what I think you spiritually want, because it does not focus on the big picture the way that the Bible does. And in fact, if you look at it from a material perspective, you only end up rewinding the clock to right before we got property, only to have no barriers to getting back, uh, getting right back into the property rat race, because you never resolve the internal contradictions that go beyond class. So just to, I'll be try to be quick, right? The first thing uh, you talked about the Jewish question. Marx does not agree with Bauer in this regard. But Marx is maybe argumentatively, for the purposes of argument, granting Bauer, like even if you're right, I mean, but he actually ends up not agreeing with Bauer's objection to this kind of specific Jewish demand for um, for uh, religious freedom, right, within the Prussian state. What Marx is actually trying to say, not simply that, okay, even if we get rid of religion, we have one more obstacle to go. Marx is basically saying religion is not the problem. The problem is not itself religion. The problem is the world that 
leads to the estrangement by religion between man and his world, right? So for Marx, this does not conclude in the idea that we need to get rid of religion and then, you know, through the state, uh, acquire all of our morality. No, that's, that's kind of a ridiculous view because actually Marx identifies statehood itself within that same text with the alienation, estrangement, and transcendence um, corresponding to the same alienation he's talking about. So for Marx, the more it's not that he has a um, prescriptive conclusion of the Jewish question, what he basically is telling us in that work is that uh, by being delivered to the world of man and participating in the world of man as it actually is, by working in the world, uh, let's say participating in the development of the class struggle and yada, 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 we will be directly participating in the active, um, the active, uh, the active, uh, let's say, source of the kind of estrangement and alienation that Bruno Bauer wants to blame on religion, right? So for Marx, participating in that does not simply mean, uh, you know, uh, the state or, or even deriving an ethics purely based on statehood. I also do want to give a distinction between ethics and morality, because while I do think ethics is inherently tied to statehood, and that was also Hegel's view, right? I think morality is something more ambiguous, something tied to the aesthetic. Morality is based on the intuition. Um, it's based more on a kind of, uh, based more kind of on uh, a question of the relationship between being and will, right? That is different from ethics, which is more based on how our will exists within the confines of uh, a specific institution of some kind. It's constrained by a specific institution of some kind. For so I just don't really agree with the kind of view that this is the implication for Marx. As a matter of fact, for Marx, he would consider this an attempt to basically um, av uh, avoid humanity as it is. Only through the state means humanity also in an alienated form somehow so i don't i don't think you can draw that conclusion from marx that he simply agrees with plato uh, i think the question of morality and i'm going to just finish it the second question with the same one when i say uh there remains contradictions i'm not talking about class contradictions so we don't have to talk about social inequality or any of those other things just not relevant. Of course, inequalities will always exist. Maybe we disagree about the reason why, but it's not important for Marx, right? The inequality in question just has to do with the fact that the way in which mankind reproduces both of himself and reproduces the meaning he possesses in relation to his world is not fixed. It's not absolute, right? It's continually caught in a process of reproduction and history. So, for example, if we have a specific relationship to nature, that is defined by a specific threshold of our technology and of our, you know, of our relationship to the external world, right? And the internal contradiction that imposes itself from that is not going to come from outside. It's going to come from the fact that it, it is not complete. There is always an element outside of humanity, for example, within nature, that, um, that imposes its significance on us eventually, right? And then once we acknowledge that, in the form of what maybe Heidegger will call an event, that gives rise to novelty and newness. So this is how change occurs, right? That's what I mean by the internal in uh, inconsistency. Also, the same thing is true for aesthetics. When it comes to developing our ability to give willful expression to what we are, which is inherently aesthetical, right? Um, for example, we will still be making... Um, We'll still be building houses in communism. But what will those houses look like beyond the technological necessity 
of what they must what function they must perform there's an element of contingency of okay well how should they look on top of what what they should there's wiggle room there right which is the room for our will right and there in the sphere of the aesthetics and the developing of our aesthetic pursuits we can maintain also an open connection and relationship to uh the divine uh in a, in a, as opposed to the kind of modernistic technical uh, technical rationalistic science so that's what i mean by the internal contradiction within the aesthetic like the development of new um ways of giving expression to ourself is inevitable if only for the fact that it's never complete so i'm going to be fair with um further critique on of what marx said on the jewish question because i feel like that would be a strike against the channel because i mean i'm sure marx isn't operating well, from you can say what you want dude like i'm probably gonna take this down and put it on odyssey after anyways i, I can't have it on youtube because of the intros well well i know that um Haas is streaming on youtube so i want to be respectful of that but okay all you have to do is just scroll Wait, what, to what the is the of... what's the problem with intros well, uh, the intros on the intros I was using on my video on my channel before you joined. It's not going to be on your okay, okay. stream, but so anyway, it's just the fact you can just go all the way to the end of uh, Marx's essay on the Jewish question to see what he feels about religion and what he feels about um, Christianity in relation to Judaism and what he prescribes um, for Judaism in order for um, in, in order for uh, emancipation to happen. So. Yeah, I'm just going to leave that over like, there uh, because it, this is, it's just, it seems to be a, a uh, we're probably going to be, continue to be talking past each other if, um, if, if you hold on to the lens that Marx has room for religion as a superlative good and, and everyone else, especially everyone else seems to have this understanding that, well, there, there are, there's a lot of highly, uh, there's a lot of truths within Marxism and the Marxist and that framework, but it's just, it, has a problem with religion i think we'll have yeah, to just just, just, see there. just to like so, i'm not gonna push back but just so we can kind of agree to disagree our disagreement basically comes down to in that text if we can draw a distinction between religion uh religiosity as such and religious estrangement religious alienation as well and i would and i recognize it's a heterodox view within among marxists but I would say there is a distinction between the two. I, I, religious estrangement, the way in which religion is somehow cut off from the world, uh, made blind to the world, I think that is not the same as um, not the same as religiosity as such. Um, so I, I think that that's basically where we we probably will just disagree on whether that distinction can be drawn. Well, if we disagree about the theory, I, I, I will grant that many practitioners of Marxism come to realize that they cannot do away with the religious element and that if they are to ignore it, then, well, good goodbye society. So at, le at the very least, there, this is a revisionism through practice that has to happen to the theory, which means that if you do take this heterodox position, not, you should not, consider that to be clear, it's not beyond the... Marxism. Not heterodox with regard to what I thought Marx meant, but just heterodox among how Marxists interpret it, right? Academics. Um, because I think, uh, I do kind of think religion can be revived in Marxism, just not philosophy. My, my basic thesis, my whole shtick is like, the problem Marx has with religion is philosophy. It's the way religion is rendered into philosophical consciousness. And this is what Marx wholly rejects. But if there's such a thing as religion beyond philosophy, it's not incompatible. Well, ignoring Marx's views, like let's say if we take a Lenin, uh, as I know in our video we, we quoted him twice, uh, mainly regarding like a materialist physicalism. Like, uh, do you disagree with him being like a physicalist? Yes. Okay. Uh, it's more Mansillo and M's domain on that one, I guess. 
Wait, well, well, regarding disagree. Lenin being a physicalist, is a in the one book that you disagree right? with Lenin, or you disagree that he was a physicalist? I disagree that he was a physicalist. Um, it, it just seems to me like just like reading it, um, that when he says like um, especially his idea of like consciousness, like he just says like to sort of solve the what's now known as like the hard problem of consciousness, he just like oh yeah, it's just matter organized in a particular way. It's not it seems like a, just like a non-answer, and it's like the idea of how consciousness comes about is just you know our biology somehow, so, rather than having a more um, I know he's like critiquing like the neo-Kantians, like the Machians and the um the uh, Bogdanov people. So the problem is, is matter, is that some kind of specific physical form i was actually just about to mention that matter matter does not necessarily denote uh physicalism materialism doesn't necessarily the, denote the problem with physicalism. physicalism is that physicalism implies a specific view about the physical world it implies the physical world is in such such way there is a specific physical form right because what is actual, what is the physics itself? What is that, right? So that's the issue with the idea of, uh, of a physicalism. Now, matter is going to be something entirely different. Matter is going to actually kind of, in that interpretation, mean the opposite. If consciousness is just matter organized in a specific way, then the question is begged as to what that matter actually consists of. And knowing what that matter consists of is not based on um, is not based on the invocation of some dogmatic form. Uh, it's based on some kind of practical participation in it, right? The actual matter is the essence of the thing. So it's also saying consciousness is just um, the essence of consciousness organized in a specific way now so, you're using mat you're using matter as a synonym for essence so it's like basically like saying essence organized in a certain way yes because and the reason i'm using it as a synonym for essence is because stalin would later elaborate that the object of dialectical materialism is the contradiction between form and content matter uh -huh. being the content which is also you know, Another word for and, and, for and I can see why you would say that that would be a synonym for essence. I'm, I think I'm beginning to actually understand your worldview for once. And this is where I have problems too, because in order to debate about philosophical um, positions, especially metaphysics, you have to be very consistent with terminology. And there is terminology that's been used since basically Aristotle. And when Aristotle just talks about what essences are comprised of, the substances, he divides it into two things matter in form or idea or whatever and of course he takes form not to just be like a a synonym for appearance but he's borrowing you know plato's logic where where, where it's based off of idos except instead of making it all about these good universals he makes them a lot more particular and he makes them into abstract particulars the the, the way they're arranged yeah so it's so like a, a substantialistic view of matter so, so that's a, that's a problem here because essences, they they are they're composed of matter, they're composed of form, and the, the arrangements have typically been seen as more important. In fact, it got to the point where, um, where th that where form just becomes the s substance that's taken for granted, which is this is where you start to see in Spinoza, which yeah, is that's what I was going to say. I was just going to say that. Goes, yeah. So at, at some point, when we're talking about is what's more prime, what's more um, primal, or, or what's what's more primary? Is it form or is it matter? You, if you say essence, you're basically saying both at the same time. To me, um, I think Marx is similar to thinkers like Heidegger, right? In the sense that Marx, in his critique of philosophy. He doesn't just contend himself with German idealism. For Marx, it's also that somehow uh, in that um, classical period in ancient Greece, which by the way, en Engels, Frederick Engels also writes, is the origin of private property, the family, the state, uh, as we know it, right? There derives some kind of, um, some kind of uh, change where 
the understanding of what matter, essence, yada yada is kind of becomes straight jacketed under the framework of an idealism, right? Or as Heidegger would put it, uh, being becomes um, forgotten in the name of, you know, um, the logos or the idea and so on. Or as Dugan would put it, being, sorry, logos emerges to the exclusion of chaos. I think they're, they're all talking pretty much about the same thing in my opinion. And Marx, Marx's notion of materialism differs, and he writes about this, differs from the uh, Spinozist one, which Marx calls and nature estranged from man, as well as the empiricist one, which Marx calls a collection of dead facts, the British materialism. It's a dialectic materialism, according to which the essence of a thing the content of a thing does not somehow pre-exist or even come at the expense of what that thing is because it is what that thing is. So, for example, the essence of a nation, or let's just be less problematic, the essence of, um, the essence of uh, any given thing, the essence of, uh, let me just, maybe let's just say the essence of a state. I like that one, right? The essence of a state is not some hidden form somewhere in reality that pre-exists the state. It is the state as it actually really is, right? So it's only by uh, analyzing the state with regard to its, itself, its own interrelation, do you actually arrive at what the content of the state is. So for Marx, we have a materialism or a kind of, let's just call it essentialism, where the essence is a living essence. It's an essence that lives through its forms, um, <laughs> not at their expense somehow. Like Spinoza is a Satanist, right? Spinoza believes one primal substance, one unity of content and form that pre-exists all of reality or is primary with regard to all of reality and that all of reality is merely kind of um, derivative from that. And his notion of substance in an extremely uh, barbaric way replaces God. It turns God into this dead thing, this necrophiliac kind of dead object uh, for which all of reality is, is derivative of. And Marx radically differs from this view. Uh, I will acknowledge, though, there are some Soviet philosophers like Evald Ilyenkov, and it is common among Russian Marxists in general, like Plakhanov, to interpret Marxism as quote unquote dynamized Spinozism. But I think this stems from their narrow um, kind of uh, interpretation of, of Marx, and I also think it's contradicted by Stalin, especially, he does not view Marxism. Dynamize Spinoza's. I, I also just I, I just find it very hard to believe that whenever Marx talks about the materiality of something, you're supposed to uh, 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 you know control F and replace it with essence of something. Well, I, I, he 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 started off in a in an intellectual milieu that was pure on materialism and that. His his PhD thesis was on Democritus and Epicurus, well, on, and these are all materialistic. A more, a more practical, a more practical example of uh, materiality not being uh, uh, equatable to like physicality is uh, you you could you could observe culture as being material, uh, well, even though you it, you really don't have to go further to understand what Marx means by it. Than in the German ideology when in its first premises of the materialist method, because Marx is not actually coming from a materialistic milieu, right? The young Hegelians are, you know, firmly in the idealist camp, and they kind of vacillate between Fichte, which is the kind of pure idea, pure transcendence, let's say, and or Spinoza, which is again for Marx, nature estranged from man. Versus Fichte, man estranged from nature, right? So the young Hegelians are vacillating between these two things. And Marx kind of pursues this golden middle, this um, reconciliation, or let's just say this sublation 
So in the first premises of the materialist method, Marx begins with man, right? Begins with man, and then, because that's, he's critiquing Feuerbach here, right? And so he's beginning with Feuerbach's man, just humanity, right? Without any other presumptions or assumptions being made. Then he says, man, what is man? Well, man has to reproduce himself somehow. Man is the world of man. So the first step is to just understand how does man exist? How does man reproduce himself? So this is a good example of what Marx means by the material. What's material for Marx is not some hidden substance defining reality. It's just the way in which overt forms really exist. And the way they really exist does require criticism, as in, like, you have to understand that it's not on going to just be on the surface of the appearance. You have to actually put in work to understand how the thing that appears to you is able to appear to you in the way that it does, right? Um, so, you know, to me, it's pretty clear that just in Marx's own works, it's, it's clear that by materialism, he doesn't mean a primal substance. He doesn't mean like uh, whether the, this weird empirical geometrical object uh, of Hobbes and the English material, Baconian materialists or Spinoza's kind of uh, substance or even other, the other French materialists. I mean, Marx does distinguish himself from all hitherto schools of materialism. I think Marx continues to insist on the word materialism strictly because he thinks what they did get correct was striving toward an orientation toward um, the primacy of content. They just ended up all failing because they tried to straightjack content under some new form, which they called substance or they called it sense, sense object or something else. So I guess in one sense, we're pretty much arguing about whether Marx was, to use you know, Fichte's uh, uh, term, terminology, if he was the antithesis or the synthesis. And I guess here, this, is, this could be a mere um, historical um, and historical squabble where we, we just have to agree to disagree here. But I think the consequences of um, this difficult interpretation wreaked a lot of havoc when it came to um, the clarity of the Marxist-Leninist movements in the sense that phys physicalism seems to have pervaded many of these movements. A humanistic um, force divorced from God as inspiration, but rather with the with, motivated by the lens that man is alone and determines his own destiny, regardless of his relationship to the divine. That seems to be a huge central motivation behind most most uh, communist movements, at least until reality starts to hit them in the face. And even then, not always. So I think this this lack of clarity um, is not, it, it is so damning that it, it requires either extreme revisionism or something new entirely to make sure that these questions are settled. What is most important and how do you get there? Because if I understand you correctly, what's most important is God and, and religion. And, and dialectical materialism is how you get there, in which every time you hear Marx say materialism, you clarify it to mean essence and not vulgar materialism. Well, I think um, you're right that, that a lot of communists try to abuse this lack of clarity in order to like abuse their power, come to wild conclusions. But you notice that at every turn, they're denounced by the real leaders, by Lenin, um, who denounced prolet cult and the idea of building a proletarian culture. Or Lenin's, he, he, Lenin said he was, he found it abhorrent, this idea of God building by Bogdanov and others, right? They wanted to literally create, you know, you know that kind of shit. And then also by, by Stalin, who just has a very, he, Stalin does provide clarity, you know, about what assumptions can you make and what assumptions can you not make, right? And Stalin, he allows wiggle room, right? He allows people to, um, have the wiggle room after this simplicity of his clarity of what Marxism is to pursue and explore their, their spiritual realities. But 
yeah, I mean, I, I broadly, I guess there there has been a lack of clarity overall. Um, but uh, I just wanted to say one thing. Yeah, I, I can see why you're so interested in Dugan because I I, I think w where you're going with this is that you're you're thinking of Dugan as someone who can maybe clarify uh, Marxist Leninism in in the direction that you want it to go. Yeah, yeah, more, more or less. And then kind of one last thing I did want to say is that, um, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, that trouble with religion, though, one will have to admit, that trouble with religion reflects, in general, this disaster which we can broadly call modernity. How to make sense of modernity? How to make sense of the way modernity rips apart and separates any semblance of the divine in the world that's something that took everyone marxist or not by surprise even religious people had a hard time being able to come to terms with that struggling with that understanding that so i think that is just something we all must reflect on um uh now right i just don't think that incriminates marxism i think just like um, it doesn't necessarily, maybe your view is different. I don't think modern technology is wholly incriminated. I think there's a way to redeem true modern science, a true essence of technological change without... Oh, uh, most of us, I can't speak for everyone here, but we're not like anti-technology. Like we're not necessarily, we don't think it's like inherently wrong. Or take more of Spangler's views I, on technics. Yeah. I yeah, also same. wanted to, I wanted to add to Haas's point about, um, about like how Lenin criti uh, criticized and wanted to do away with the prolet cult and all that stuff. But I also wanted to like, uh, point out that Stalin himself encouraged, uh, not to, he encouraged that people shouldn't cut off, cut off uh, religious worship from the people and uh, they should even build temples and like ascribe to the, the religious texts that that are native to them. Um, and there is there's even some communities within Russia to this day that believe that Stalin should be sainted, like he should be anointed. Like there's some Orthodox uh, Orthodox communities that believe that Stalin. Wait, who? who um i don't have the exact name on hand of uh of what parish but there's like people that make paintings and stuff of him with like halos above they want to do that with Kadrianu too in romania yeah, to, to be fair to be fair you'll find orthodox churches that will do that with just about any prominent 20th century figure including orthodox who want to do the same thing for with hitler so it's not something unsurprising but um, but it's on a much yeah. Just let me know who's day. doing it, and I'll report them to the right people. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! I was just I was, I was just giving you examples of things that I've observed from like um Russian people I've interacted with in our Discord, and they've shared images with me. Um, and I was just saying that like this runs these real world examples fly in the face of uh, Marxism Leninism being this um this uh. uh I don't know this villain against religion or religious practice. In I would also point to like an interesting fact where it's like you know after the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was a a religious revival um, in Russia. I mean, it's probably on par with the religious revival that um, Cornelia Kodranu led in interwar Romania, um, at least the t for twentieth centuries like that. And yeah, Romania there was also. I want to say also, really quick. I'm gonna ban really the dude I'm things. showing right now as he's reporting my channel apparently. There was also a large increase of prostitution and drug trafficking, human trafficking after the Soviet Union fell. Would you say those are Christian values? No, those weren't Christian values. I would say that's because of a sort of like power vacuum and the lack of like a sort of strong state. I mean, I'm not going to deny the Soviet Union um, at least gave people like a sense of stability, even though if I have disagreements with it, that's why I think you have a lot of nostalgia um, with people who sort of lived through it. Because like, you know, at least in the Soviet Union, I had a job. I had, um, you know, various, you know, government assistance and all that. Well, I'm not going to deny that, but I, I think, think that it's not. I, th I think t I think the the fact that prostitution, all those things, came about was because of a sort of like failed state, so to speak. Don't you think it could also be interpreted though that the Orthodox Church? This is going to sound kind of crazy, but wasn't the Orthodox uh -huh. Church kind of also a kind of repository of the memory of the Soviet Union after it collapsed? Like before, you kind of had this huge state. 
where there seems to be this living, um, this kind of animus, this kind of teleology of purpose. And then when it collapses, this purpose condenses and, and collapses into faith, a faith that can be personalized. Well, I mean, I would say alive. like it's sort of like the opposite happens when if you look at the sort of creation of the Soviet Union, kind of going back to our conversation earlier that we've been having about the sort of, um, you know, as Benjamin said, the slight messianic sort of teleology of, uh, or the messianic view of, or perspective of communism. So it's not that, like, when you said, like, the, the, with the collapse of the Soviet Union and, and the Orthodox Church being this repository of these ideas, I think that if you go back to, you know, 1917, that the those communist revolutionaries who were doing their thing there and creating the, 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 uh, the Soviet system, the Soviet states, what they were doing was taking on Christianity. And then when communism fell, it just went back to Christianity, if that makes well, sense. Here's, here's why I kind of have trouble um have trouble with that because don't you think that Peter the Great and the westernizers of Russia maybe did a number on infecting and infiltrating that church with foreign it, you know kind of freemasonic and western Oh, I mean, yeah, I mean we call because, it like, you know some people even call it like sort of like western ca captivity of the church. Yeah, because you 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 know that um that church that Stalin blew up famously I forgot the name of it. You probably know the name. But that church was built by a Freemason, designed by a Freemason, and who is not Orthodox Christian at all. I, mean, I really don't know what the specific... Uh, this is probably more fascist so. route because this whole thing is like uh, free Freemasonry is <laughs> what he's really into. Well, uh, going after. All, I want to I say I'm quite pleasantly surprised that Haas actually knows that much about Freemasonry in Russia. And yeah, he's right. Um, Peter the Great kind of opened the doors for Western Freemasonry into Russia, which of course historically has been a very Orthodox country, Orthodox Christian country. So um, I have been aware of the Masonic infiltration of Russia. It's never been as quick as I'm sure Masonry would like it to be. That's why it's always spread West and been more successful spreading West, especially in America, where, where I would say Freemasonry had the most success. But yeah, there was always kind of like a fifth column in Russia that was there. And um, I did not actually know that that was actually built by a Freemason. I'd have to look into that more. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, and, and by the time that, I mean, you, you know, um, that woman, Madame Blavatsky, was, she had the ear of the Tsarina, right? So we are dealing with right. a deeply corrupt, Germanized and Westernized elite in Russia. And the, I guess the common view, I think, even Dugan has this view, I believe, that what happened with the Soviet Union is basically a return to the times of uh, of um, Muscovy, of, of Ivan the Terrible. I mean, Stalin kind of says that directly when he's talking to Eisenstein. He says, so Stalin, he says multiple nice things about Ivan, right? He says, there's two people who created a monopoly on foreign trade. Uh, Ivan was the first and Lenin was the second, right? Then Stalin also goes to say, talking to Eisenstein, who's producing these very patriotic films, Alexander Nevsky and Ivan the Terrible, he says, um, Ivan kicked out the foreigners, foreign influence from Russia. This is why he was good, right? That Peter mm -hmm. the Great was a westernizer and a Germanizer. And he said, look at the court of Catherine. Is that a Russian court? No, it's all Germans, right? Right. So there's clearly this kind of there's an immense destruction that happens after the revolution. Yes. But Dugan, he identifies this um, destruction in the framework of what he calls archaeo modernity. He says the apparent destruction of the orthodoxy was just part of the history of Russian orthodoxy and led to a revival, led to a true revival. So Dugan does not identify it with this kind of. Satanism, but I mean, you contrast that with the Western liberalism, and you know the difference is very clear. Even if it allows a persistence of religiosity legally, it's a complete war on the soul, complete annihilation of the human soul. Um, because what Western liberalism is even does is much worse. It targets, I guess, in uh, to put it in Guanon's terms as. Uh, I've read through Dugan. What Western liberalism does is it seals the opening 
of the world egg, out of which the kind of revelation and access to the divine is possible. This dude's a fed troll in the in the fucking chat right now. Yeah, I don't. I that person's full of shit. I yeah, don't. like uh, yeah, I know. Like, I mean, you've had spats, but like, I've had people like this come in my channel like for weeks now, saying they're from your chat, which which is part of the reason why I've been so hostile towards you. Yeah, I don't. I've never gone that. I have not even publicly told people um comp or to be in your chat or anything. So, you know. I, let alone fucking start reporting shit. So yeah, I don't. That has nothing to do. Uh okay, yeah. Uh, as far as like the there is like the case of like um, Haas, you familiar with the, the Moscow pool and like the um the, when they tried to build the palace of the Soviets there and it didn't really work out. Like Stalin had that whole like church like just destroyed. Yeah, that was the church I was talking about. Oh, that's what the one. You're... Okay, okay, that's right. Okay, okay, I'll look into that. Thank you. I have one last question, um, or maybe a series of questions, depending on how it unfolds. Um, what do you think were Marx's personal beliefs about religion and the divine? And how do you think he uh, put those beliefs into practice throughout his life? I don't think he gave them... I think Marx was a modern man. I don't think he gave them much thought at all. I focused on a very specific thing. and But I, you know what I do think is interesting is that it seems like later in their investigations... It just so happens to come under their nose where you have things like um, the, or, the um, what is it, the origins of early Christianity, which Engels is writing very late in his life at the tail end, where Engels is saying, you know, looking back, the Christianity was one to one with, with our socialist movement. That was the socialism back then. And so there's this unique rediscovery of Christianity that happens later on, which I think, I mean, Engels was not a guy who was ignorant about Christianity or the question. I mean, he was dealing with the young Hegelians, Hegel, the criticism of religion, Feuerbach. So to me, I think, um, I think they basically ignored it, but it rears its significance anyway um, later on. Isn't this uh, Christian grouping into socialism kind of like more of like the guild socialist distributist type stuff that was like condemned as feudal socialism, though? I, I don't think so, because I think the problem... So Marx is not anti-modern, right? Marx does think there's something inevitable about technological and modernity, right? And the feudal socialists kind of had positioned themselves in a way of trying... Marx's view is not so much I'm against uh, them existing as much as like they're just coping. They're, there's no way to stop this modernity. It's going to happen. Hmm. It's just I think that you're underselling, uh, you're understating uh, Marx's agnosticism or atheism. And I think I think the reason, though, is because I'm trying to emphasize more the atheism of modernity. Which is why Marx did not have to give much attention to religion. Uh, he was living in an atheistic world. That world of industrial modern capitalism was an atheist world. Now, it wasn't atheist in the countryside, maybe. But in the heat of the class struggle between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, that was, that was an atheist world where it seemed like religion was... Um, forgotten somehow. So the question is, how would it, would it become remembered, right? And it gets remembered actually through, two, you can read it in two ways, right? Both religion becomes remembered, but also the countryside becomes remembered. The significance of the peasant is increasingly, increasingly, um, increasingly there for Marx and Engels later in their lives, uh, why they're in the, in the form of the indebted French peasant, uh, or the Russian peasant of the Mirror Commune, right? Which Marx writes, you know, the Russian Marxists are wrong. The Russians, they can just skip to communism. They already have in their traditional communes uh, the key to passing over capitalism, basically, modern capitalism. So, you know, it's, it's an interesting case. But it's not that Marx is imposing atheism. 
right? There is an inherent atheism of modernity itself. So the question is, how does Marx deal with that, right? I My view is that the way Marx deals with that leaves an opening for religion that liberalism uh, di uh, did not leave. Well, I'd have to argue that he did not have the intention of leaving an opening himself because it's one thing to be living in an atheistic world and thus you can be a Christian but think that your your job is to provide a secular philosophy at the very least, as you could say as, as a stepping ground to greater goods down the line. But Marx was a dyed-in-the-wool atheist. He lived, he was an apostate to Lutheranism, which he was baptized into. And he lived that way his entire life. And th and this is, and I like to emphasize on what people do for like their, for the, for their last rites and their burials, because the afterlife is the most important thing if you are religious. He, where was he buried? He was buried in Highgate Cemetery, the, the, east, the eastern section of Highgate Cemetery, next to all the other humanists, all the other agnostics, all the other atheists of his era, from Herbert Spencer to the guy who literally coined the term secularism. So I, I, it's one thing to argue that maybe he was a Christian guy who advocated for an, a secular philosophy that leaves room for religion to come back in in its, in its, in its essence. But he was an atheist, and almost everything but in his life points to him being an atheist. I, I don't. And it makes a lot. It doesn't make a lot of sense no, for an atheist he was, he was to an be atheist. promoting Christianity. Yeah. But, but, but this point, from, from this, point of, see, this point of him being an atheist doesn't mean that like Marxism it's, itself imposes atheism. Well, also, Marx is an atheist. You're right, but I'm just trying to say he was not the active propagand uh, propagator or. Um, for him, atheism was not something he like had to impose on reality. He was dealing with an atheistic world at the time. And so that's why you find Marx and Engels throughout their whole life mocking this kind of uh, critiques of religion. I mean, late on from a propagandistic, after their philosophical stuff, after Feuerbach, Marx and Engels are like, what is this guy who's always talking about we need to... Uh, we need to um, from, uh, talk about God doesn't exist. Marx says, who cares, right? Uh, if you don't think God exists, you think he's like the boogeyman, then why, do you, why would you keep talking about the boogeyman if it's a problem, right? He would say things like that. He would say things like, uh, you know, anti-religious propaganda among workers. It's stupid. Why would we do that, right? If whatever is going to happen to religion will happen in the course of struggle. There's no need to, um, whatever's harmful about religion to the communist struggle or to the class struggle will just reveal itself in time. You don't have to impose it. So I do think it's not that Marx intended on leaving an opening for religion. It's just that he did. And he was neither for or against this. He just didn't consider it. It wasn't on his mind. But the opening was there. What would Marx I think he must have thought? Consider it. But I just want and to you... point out real quick. I did some research on that church you were mentioning. So it was originally designed by a Freemason, um, but then once um, Alexander the First died, and then it was a. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to call you Zoltanus. I fat fingered it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my bad, my bad. Um, but once um, uh, Sard Alexander the First died, um, and it was like still early in construction, his brother Nicholas the First um, redesigned it to be pro orthodox and removed all of the Freemason stuff that was in the designs and whatnot. And it was an actual but, like orthodox, orthodox church. But I think still, like when a Freemason designs a building, I don't know if you've been in a Masonic building, like just the geometry of how it's built, you can remove all the overt references and stuff, but still, there's something unholy about how it's built and they well, know they that. chose a new site as well what is um, with all these cps usa troll well. accounts and report my account <laughs> that's so weird uh let me look at your uh channel yeah this is one of them i've been banning them non-stop they keep popping up like this guy kind of weird Do you think, it's probably some up. like retarded like left spurg Kind of like Vosh here probably stocks you. It's doing. We're this. we're getting <laughs> that that guy getting, has uh, never he's never been CPUSA twenty thirty six has never been in my chat ever. 
we're also by yeah. the way we're also getting randoms who it, they've never talked in in the youtube chat on our side in the igg chat that are claiming that uh that the zoltanius crowd is reporting our chat and saying all this wild shit about like oh we're gonna report your chat too yeah amiria just i think i'm not i might it's either a left youtuber who doesn't like either of us or like there's like this ukrainian tele pro ukrainian telegram channel that like doxed pacifist his family his wife his child address we, everything and we literally had, we don't we don't report fascists we don't oh, no 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 like i'm saying that this like pro ukrainian channel has been like targeting people in my circle like too. azov people like, like like actual azov people who have been targeting people like in my inner circle support, by the way <laughs> <It'd be a> <laughs> they literally, fight for they literally been her harassing probably. pacifist irl so it could be them doing that that's really fucking weird yeah it like honestly they, it, it's it looks like to me it looks like a targeted disruption tactic for, okay. for the whole for the whole debate panel i'll, I'll just keep i'll just keep banning them yeah, sorry so, to derail everything but like uh, uh it'd be interesting to get more into the contract uh, conversation to masonry though because like that brings up like, the whole thing like the angle the anglos uh some other stuff it's probably breaking tos but uh, you and fascist could probably have a pretty good conversation on that uh yeah sure i would I like to kind of up. return back to it sorry i just yeah i'm gonna let you talk further i just wanted to say this since i i haven't been talking much tonight but uh yeah i'm i'm, I'm really uh, enjoying this conversation and especially you know knowing what you what getting to know your worldview a little bit more Haas. it's actually been very enlightening for me um now I think I better understand you, and I can also definitely agree with you regarding the. Uh, I think you said two camps of communist thought, right? The one side that's you know liberal and kind of like the wash type, and then uh, what you're offering basically is is a what, what from my perspective a reinterpretation. From your perspective, it's orthodoxy. I understand that, but regardless of which is true, I, I can see there is a clear distinction there between yeah. what you for and what what it's like and, and at the very least you know even if it's even if you don't consider it orthodox like the other one isn't orthodox at all also it's almost okay. like it's caught with these two paths that you know are to be clear like our um forefathers communist forefathers did not give an exact stance on you know they did we obviously have the hegemony being able to cite them and refer to them but, like, this is definitely a new internal struggle. I think it goes back to the Sino-Soviet split. And even, even tankies, it goes even to, to self-proclaimed MLs, right? Most of them, in, obviously most of them in America, but even at other places in the world. India, I've seen, right? Where they just have this George Soros interpretation, and they're literally connected to the NGOs and, yeah. and all that shit. So it's like... You know, um, I mean, one of the dudes who originally doxed me uh, was literally a part of the North Atlantic Council. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's it's fucking insane. Like, we you have these so called tankies that are, you know, but I, I think it goes my you know my my conspiracy theory has always been that you know we are ruled by ex communists or even people who might secretly be communists, but it's going back to the Sino Soviet split, like. Sometimes right wingers are correct when they say, "Yeah, oh, oh my God, we're ruled by commies or whatever." Maybe there's truth to that, but I think maybe what they miss, they get wrong, is that this is an internal civil war, like that goes back to that Sino-Soviet split between Mao's peasant populism and the managerial elites that were part of the Soviet bureaucracy. And you know, that's just been my worldview. Or we can call it maybe the Dionysian and the Apollonian characteristics of Marxist Leninism with the Dionysian more focused on the sensual, you could say, liberal aspects of it. You know, well, it's, it's going to be a nice, happy paradise and we can do whatever we want and we won't have to worry about anything. And then there's the people who are concerned with the struggle and imposing order and the morality of it all. That's yeah. what I, I would describe as the main difference. And Yeah, I mean, like, uh, you know, that it, it's just there's there's just crazy shit like um i mean even intuitively i mean i think everyone can is clear 
just normal people you you show them like hey do you really think the communists are these like blue hair fucking degens and like furries and shit and it's like i mean it, it, there's clearly something off about that association right so you know not just that an aesthetic I think, I think level. Everyone but here on the panel agrees with you on that one. Yeah, I we, think we a blue haired, blue haired freak. We I, don't go and say, "Oh, that person's a commie just because they have, they're waving a hammer and sickle." Like, I yeah, I mean, like, what do you think stuff. would happen to those type of people under Stalin? Like, yeah, I, I, I don't think Stalin would 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 tolerate furries. I think Stalin would probably think they're mentally ill, and you know, yeah. So yeah. I, I do wonder though what Stalin's first sona would have been. Uh, <laughs> no, that's blasphemy. That's probably that's, a beer. That's uh, no, come on. <laughs> Maybe the Russian eagle. <laughs> no, chill, chill. Don't say stuff like that. Yeah, this is our, uh, our this is our religion. That's that's like blaspheming the prophet. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, like even that, during the Russian Revolution itself, you had people like. Alexandra Kolontai, who is more into the hypothetical of having, you know, free love and radical feminism more than uh, she was concerned with. She, uh, you could say, she, liberation. she, um, so she, she wasn't specifically. Sorry, give me one second. I am betting that uh, his food is here. Well, uh, while <laughs> while we're giving Haas one moment, uh, Yevetsky, I wanted to say. Uh, I, I I linked uh, a blog and then a news article talking about um, yeah. Stalin's relationship with the Orthodox Church, and there's actually images of like so, old uh, old paintings of uh, Stalin depicted as a saint by by people who were supportive of the Russian so Orthodox Church. I mean, you have that. I, mean, I don't I don't deny that, but I think you yeah. have it infinitely more with like Romania, where they like um you know valorize or they want to um even there's this guy I forgot his name and maybe someone in the comments can make him, but he's a he's this Romanian um he he died a little while ago, but he was a Romanian theologian and he said that Cornelio Codreanu, who was like the leader of the third positionist movement in Romania, and he in my opinion arguably led the largest religious revival movement in the twentieth century in Romania. Um this, there's little literally literally like Romanian saints who are saying that he should be canonized because of what he did as well. So, so he, he I think both so ways. Just, I think that I think that the Russian population is much larger and greater than than Romanian population. So yeah, but what I'm saying is, that I think that the sort of if you want to like compare, like um, com do a comparison. I mean, there's people who want, there's people who've tried to canonize like Sternberg, even though he was like a Lutheran. So just, yeah, I uh, mean, there's always that people trying to do to, weird to stuff. To briefly go back to the um, Kalantai thing, so she was hugely critical of of feminism. She thought like feminism as a movement was bourgeois, and she, I think, the association with free love was more like she was kind of trying to say um, not free sex, sex love, but like free love in this kind of strict sense of escaping the economic motivations and stuff. But even then, just the phrase really bothered Lenin. He was like, what do you mean free love? That's like, you know, not everybody wants to drink the same, uh, what did he say, like dirty tap water or some shit like that. And he basically had a conservative view, but... You know, Kalantai, for comparison, highlighted the importance of motherhood. We said we're not just women, we're mothers, right? So in order to um, focus on the needs of women, you know, they you have to focus on supporting motherhood, supporting mothers, things like that. So Kalantai, I'm just trying to say, even her, who's considered more kind of having a feministic orientation although she was not a feminist herself radically different than than uh you know the cultural politics of of leftists that you find today which say things like you know uh woman uh, motherhood is oppressive and families are all you know oppression and yada 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 mm. I guess it might not just be her. I just know there was a faction of um, of Marxists at the time or Bolsheviks who were into that camp. And I'll, I'll give they you more. Were eventually out as bourgeois moralists. The, 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 there was an American woman that that was along those lines, but I'm aware that Marx threw her out. Yeah. <laughs> Marx got rid. So I'll give I'll give you more. I'll give you more regarding the weird factions in 
Soviet state. Now, these were people who were not particularly loyal. They weren't loyal to the Bolsheviks or anything like that, but they were theosophists. And they were occultists, right? Um, and these people, you had a lot of weird stuff, let's just say, happen with that prolet cult. Like, um, the ideas of the formalists, for example, where they just kind of wanted art to replace... Yeah, they wanted to artistically and demiurgically replace reality. Transhumanists who wanted, like, to overcome the physical physical vessel of the human body itself. So there was a lot of weird, wacky things going on there. All of it was put to an end, but they kind of slipped through the cracks and they could, taking advantage of the vacuum did acquire prominence in the 20s in the Soviet Union, but uh, they were thoroughly denounced by the uh, socialist realism. There were there. I'm I'm trying to say like there was the the, the Soviet avant garde. I mean, they were like doing, the Soviet futurists, basically. Yeah, but they were they were engaging in ideas that you would not see pop up until like this this weird Silicon Valley type of um, post humanism that comes around, you know, thousands and nineties and shit. So that is just a, a, a also final weird thing about that is that. Um, a lot of those Silicon Valley people were people who emigrated from the Soviet Union. Use chips because the Soviets produced some of the best mathematicians in the world. So, you know, Intel and the rest. I think Intel was founded by a Soviet immigrant. So, yeah, I mean, that's just, just an observation. Hmm. Which is, it's such a crime that the West still carries forth this stereotype that Russians are a brutal, stupid, and immoral people. That like everyone is some sort of, um, it runs an import-export company or is part of the mafia and just dr run dresses in, in, you know, in Adidas sport pants when, when they're not trying to take over the entire world. Even though they produce some of the most intelligent uh, mathematicians, chemists, biologists, poets, philosophers, ever, yeah. really. Yeah, and, I actually and, can and recommend... Re I can recommend a book on that. It's called, uh, I don't know if you've heard of it. It's called The Last Ring Bearer. You ever heard of that? No, I haven't. What's it's it like this Russian take on Lord of the Rings where they're pushing back on Tolkien and they're saying that was a complete propaganda, right? And actually, Mordor was actually like some civilized, enlightened place of philosophers and you know, into artists and intellectuals and whatever, and that it was Mordor, which was like this. Sorry, it was the uh, the elves and whatever dwarves and hobbits, whatever. These were all like elves. You mean Anglo's? Yeah, pretty. That's pretty much what the book is. Yeah. <laughs> so, my favorite Lord of the Rings takes is from um, E. Michael Jones, who basically argues that the problem with Lord of the Rings is that it's not anti-Semitic enough. Um, oh boy. <laughs> I think, are you aware of I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go too far in that route. It could actually probably hurt Pause's channel. I was gonna say. I was yeah. gonna say you guys should. You guys should read Stalin and the Scientists. Uh, it's like a historical. Uh, it's like a collection of like historical achievements of science that were made under uh, St uh, Stalin and the Soviet uh, regime. I mean, I don't think any of us deny that, like, you know, collective, like, or, you know, central plane, like, more or less works and whatnot. Like, don't, we're not, like, libertarians here. Don't you guys see yourselves as, like, kind of, like, revolutionizing, like, Darwin, like, with, the, like, Lysenkoism and stuff like that, though? Uh, like, what do you mean? Well, I know you, there was, like, this guy did, like, an entire video series of, uh, how, how, how Lysenko is basically building off of Darwin, kind of, like, changing his theory a bit, but it's still compatible with, like, uh, yeah. like, natural sciences yeah yeah i think that's also a theological issue because everything kind of goes back to that right it all goes back to this question of the relation of form and content and, and um the mendelian interpretation of darwinism or even even darwin's own interpretation and, and lysenko knew that there were limitations in darwin kind of comes to this idea that like you know there's no inherent kind of like purpose of 
change in evolutionary history. It all just a bunch of random accidents. Uh, and the only thing that's constant is the gene. And this kind of like stand in for a, a, a metaphysical substance. But Lysenko's whole stick is like that there's an importance of form, right? And that, you know, he, he really finds it horrific, this idea that like, that an organism is just the nutritive soil for the gene. He finds this extremely vulgar and, you know, uh, and basically, um, how do I put it? Barbaric. Like, no, the form of the animal is important in, in the process of its change and development. The form of the organism. Form is also another word for spirit in a lot of ways. Um, depending on how you think of it. So there's that, you know. I think Lysenko is kind of an orthodox Russian conservative uh, biologist. Because he's What's also up? drawing from the tradition, the Russian tradition of Ivan Michurin, right? Before any Marxism, before any, uh, any of the communism, right? So, yes, he's a Marxist. He's a Marxist-Leninist. And it is compatible with dialectical materialism. But I think people tend to overlook the Russian Russianness of Lysenko. Hmm. Uh, I think people also overlook the... Oh, sorry. I didn't realize. I was just, on, a, on a final note, a lot of these kind of like fake conservatives in America uh, will try to say shit like, you know, there's a neo-Lysenkoism, which is this kind of social constructivistic view that there's no biological realities and, you know, we can just mold human beings to an ideology but that has nothing Tabula to do with Raza stuff, basically. Yeah, it has nothing to do with Lysenko. Anything Lysenko actually says, you know. That's that's more just um uh, again a uniquely American left liberal kind of thing. Uh, another oh. thing too that's really significant is that there's um in the old in the old infrared server that we had there was a, uh, we had an archive of a, a bunch of different uh, peer-reviewed medical studies that actually confirmed uh, a lot of what Lysenko was saying, uh, uh, like long ago, like a long time ago. And there, I can I can pull up one of uh, one of them. Their ncbi.gov, where they basically talk about how MES as a system has been completely outmoded, and they can't there's no way to verify the veracity of the system and the role that genes like they think that in in this uh in one of these articles that i found they're basically positing that uh the colloquial understanding of genetics by as commonly understood by americans has been set back by over 50 years by this by by the mendelian epigenetic system um, and there's no way to like, uh, they can't reproduce the claims that are made by the Mendelian ep epigenetic system. It's like really interesting to read. And the, uh, the, the research paper that I found it, it states that there's more, uh, alterations that may, may, uh, alterations that may occur to to uh some to, to a people's dna are more likely to happen due to um cultural uh cultural influences and influences from food and geography it's really fascinating uh, is there anything you want to say on regarding uh, lysenko m yeah, uh, apologies for the interruption earlier. Um, I had a delay on. It's fine. Any, um, but before before you respond, like uh, I want to say, Mancilla wants to talk strictly Dugan eventually because like he does work with people. Who no, are, I, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, gotta, gotta go. get heading out soon. Yeah. Oh, don't wanna, yeah, we can just. I don't. All right. I, I, well, I'll just say this really quick. Like next Sunday, I'm gonna be having a guy, one of the co-founders of New Resistance, who actually works directly with Dugan, coming on for an interview. So we don't have an exact time yet, but he, he's from Brazil. Then. Pacifist wants to talk like World War II related 
stuff and uh, just let him continue? Uh, yeah, uh, Zolt, what, what was it again that you wanted me to bring up? I'm sorry. Uh, oh, well, he was talking about like theosophy and how like masonry was targeted, but there, there's a lot, a lot of stuff like involving uh, the Third Reich where a lot of that stuff was targeted too. That would probably be an interesting conversation between you two because yeah, you, you're pretty big on you're pretty big on like Third Reich revisionism, but also on Soviet revisionism from Grover yeah, so, Fur to David Irving. Right. So we we run a channel called Stalinist Revisionism Channel, which um, a lot of people that <laughs> visit the channel. They, they would describe it as very pro-Stalin. And uh, it's it was once in a while we do uh, compare and contrast between uh, Stalin and Hitler. And it's interesting to see a lot of positive overlaps. So we, like, for we um, probably can, can we go over this on YouTube, though, because, you know. Yeah, I'm not going to I'm not going to talk about Hitler. Okay. I'm just going to talk about like Stalin more so. Yeah. Um, but like his his views on uh like what you what you brought about brought up about the, theosophy and the attacks against like these occultists um it, it parallels a lot of what uh the other guy did on well, the other the, end. The, what i would disagree with that about though is that you know maybe there's some monopoly that's being established um let's just call him the painter maybe yeah. there's um, Austrian painter. <laughs> yeah maybe there's like a some kind of um monopoly established over the occult but i mean it's very clear the connection theosophy it through the ss in particular right i mean even even so, the found, founding of the 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 nazi party and its origins that comes from the kind of occult russian emigres and then uh, others and then you know you have the ariosophy uh you have rosenberg and then the adoption of the swastika itself, you know? Well, the, the swastika as a symbol was used even before, you know, the 20th century by various peoples, including Russians. You know, it's it's basically a universal symbol. You can find it on virtually every continent. No, no, so I, I know. Like, but the reason they yeah. adopted it was because they were coming from this area, ariosophical, sorry, ariosophological well, background. Uh, Right, I'm, I'm ahead, guys. Go to you're, 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 you're correct. You're correct yeah. that people like Ma Madame Blavatsky and the uh, the uh, people that followed Ariosophy they used it too. Um, that's absolutely true. You're correct about that. But my point is to say that they did it because of them and that specific group. I think is kind of conflating it because, well, like I said, lots of people used it all over. Well, it, Blavatsky reasons. was the <laughs> Theosophist. When I say Ariosophy, I mean this kind of idea that the symbol is an ancient Aryan symbol right yeah and this guy that's what ariosophy is it's kind of like this idea of an aryan people stretching right. from the indus to tibet uh you know um then there's the kind of hyperborean ideas which dugan yeah, yeah there's is, different factions that believe slightly yeah, different well, things just this general idea that there's this kind of aryan race that stands in opposition to the kind of judeo-christian one quote unquote and the swastika is really adopted in complete con in contradistinction to the Christian cross, right? Whereas the cross is this kind of arresting of time, just in the strict sense of like, this is the one monotheistic truth. Swastika was adopted, according to these people, because they had a kind of cyclical view of more pagan understanding being, right? The area softs, right? The people that followed Ariosophy. Yeah, yeah. And then one yeah. of them, though, was distinguished, but I don't think he was very prominent in the <laughs> Nazi party. But he was of the view that Arians created the Old Testament. And, you know, Jesus was an Arian who came down to... He had this kind of specific view. But the majority were against Christianity. And the uh, majority were against... Uh, uh, Jesus the majority Christ. of the uh, the majority of the SS, you mean, right? The majority of the people who were uh, involved in Ariosophy and and Ariosophy. kind of the okay. yeah. No, yeah. if you if you're gonna say the majority of the people that were involved with Ariosophy, I definitely agree with you. Yes, that's true. But it, we also have to keep in mind that Ariosophy was also eventually banned in the Third Reich. I think it was around um, 
Definitely by 1941, July 7th, 1941. That's when they had Heydrich shut down all the Ariosophy uh, clubs and uh, lodges you... and whatever. So wait, what was it? It was called the what shutdown? Uh, by I mean, I did an entire video on this. If you're interested, I can share the information yeah. with you. But by, by July 7th, I believe it was the date, 1941, they, they had a total ban on all the cold things, and that included Ariosophy. Um... Yeah, I've never I've never heard of that because it seems to me that um you said July seventh. Yeah, I've I've got a video on it. I can I can send it to you if you're interested. Um, I, I mean it, we don't really have to get was into the, it too much. Was the um was the uh the the Norse pagan wolf's angle still integrated on SS uniforms? The what? The wolf? Uh, wolf's angle. The, that, that, SS, the, the SS, the SS like, icon like the, or the SS logo that's on the collar. I think I think there was there was a um, there was a kind of um, so wait, Eric, continue on the end. by the time. Yeah, I think I think there was a crackdown on specific factions, but not the whole thing. And specifically the ones that were within the SS that they had a monopoly on um remained within, right? But so I th I think there were these organized groups that were outside of the Nazi party that they in general were cracking down on, but in general, no, it was um, it was not erased from the foundation of the party and the SS. Thank you, Jackson, for the raid. Appreciate you so much, man. So, um, are you talking about Ariosophy, like as in the different uh, clubs and lodges that followed? No, Ariosophy? no. Like, so, sorry. to explain the the term, Ariosophy is just the kind of <laughs> worldview and and philosophy. Basically, is, is so Sophie is a word that's usually attached to like a specific tradition, like theosophy, philosophy, right. uh, and Ariosophy. The root for Ari, right? Ario, or it's also called Arminism, is just about this idea of of um, Arianism, more or less, right? It's the idea yeah. of mystical Arianism, right? So it's not like a it's not like a Freemasonic organization. It's more like a set of no, beliefs no, and yeah. philosophies. Would you also, group uh, Shuan into that? Who? Uh, Shu Fridjof Shuan. Uh, he has like an entire book on like uh, Arianism, and he's like one of the perennial school people. Frederick Shuan. Fridjof Shuan. Rudrov. Uh, it's it's spelled. Uh, it, it was in the Fritjof is F R I T H J O F Fritjof Shuan. Let me look. I think it's like one of the founders of the perennial school. There's also there's there's a lot of historical examples of the uh, the Norse pagan Odal rune uh, being used as uh, military pins and patches. Um, I don't yeah, know if you guys know about that. No, no, yeah, you're right. They did use such symbols. Uh, and they also in integrated the, 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 Norse the Norse pagan wolf's angle uh, is what the SS was directly based off of. And that yeah, was integrated and, into the uniforms. There, there was and basically it, yeah. this vague idea that Christianity was, you know, this invasive thing. They, did, they didn't completely destroy the church, but I think they did debase it in a lot of ways. Um, so, yeah, so and were, also, were, also in private, all, in private, Hit, Hitler kind of viewed the the Christian Church as antithetical to uh, to his plans. So, so no, look, uh, we have to be we have to be clear because the, you're correct that there were certain figures in the government that were uh, anti-Christian. So people like Dare, people like Bormann, uh, these were definitely uh, even Rosenberg. Rosenberg, I, I would say he was kind of a an absolute heretic. He never directly said anything negative about Jesus Christ, but he was very uh, oppositional to um, organized Christianity, especially 
um, going as far as to oppose Paul and Matthew. I think he had issues with Paul and Matthew, and, and he makes that very clear in his book, Myth of the 20th Century. But if you look at other figures, for example, um, like, uh, like Hitler himself. Pardon? Uh, Struppel. Yes, yeah, St Wilhelm Stoppel is a good example, right? Wilhelm Stoppel was uh, was an advisor under uh, uh, the guy that was running the uh, state church relations. I forgot, I forgot who it was. You might remember Zolt, but um, he was he was he was an advisor to that guy, um, and he he wrote a he wrote a uh, little uh, essay or book called Six Chapters on uh, National Socialism, or sorry, Six Chapters on Christianity and National Socialism. I've done an audiobook reading of that book. That that's that's a very good little book, and that that actually debunks a lot of the uh, claims about the, this this view that uh, national socialism was actually inherently I antagonistic think, towards Christianity. I think Stoppel was kind of a compromise with the Nazi Party, though. I don't think he he lied at the root of the institution, and I think he he shared that with the other kind of other uh, German conservatives at the time who decided, you know what, we're just gonna accept nazism basically because it's saving us from bolshevism and it's saving us from decay of the weimar and their views so like you know i think that represented the kind of attempt to make a, a, a synthesis right but that was not the foundation of the nazism um I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know what you mean by the foundation of Nazism, because National Socialism as a political philosophy and idea goes back at least about 300 years before Hitler, um, maybe 250 is a, is a more reasonable uh, estimate. Um, well, I mean, regardless, the specific German milieu out of which the Nazis would arise of is definitely mm -hmm. from uh, occultism and theosophy. Theosophy is, is is that based on uh, the connection to the tool so tool society? The, in, in, um, they're connected to it, but theosophy comes from the Russian Adam Blavatsky. Right, it's through the Russian emigres that Nazism would basically take take shape and form. That were the followers of Blavatsky. Actually, even the Tsarina, right, on her notebook. What, uh, but, at the when she was uh, being held prisoner, she had a swastika on her notebook, and she would always draw swastikas, and that was because she was uh, a theosophist. Uh, she she was inspired by the thinking of Blavatsky and yada yada yada. So those ideas find their way to Germany in the aftermath, and out of this uh, arises Nazism. Okay, I mean, again, I, I I really have to question because you say that she drew swastikas because she was interested in theosophy, um, but like the usage of the swastika, even the Soviet Union used the swastika in the in the nineteen twenties. Surely you're aware of that. Yeah, yeah, no, I know they did. Uh, yeah, the Red Army. Right. Yeah, and but and I don't think that had anything to do with theos theosophy, right? Even I, Sternberg, who was like a syncretic Christian. Yeah, Sternberg used it too, but. That guy probably was pagan, right? But they, they, um, that alone is not enough, but she was very, um, consistent in her usage of the swastika. And to me, it seems like that's an inherent connection to, um, because it's, I mean, it's like, what, it's known she was interested in the ideas of Blavatsky and the occult in general. So, it's like, it's, to me, it, it just couldn't be a coincidence, you know. Well, it's it's one thing to be interested, you know, on an academic level. That I, that much I can agree with you on. But to say no, no, that she on, actually... on a practical level, on a right. on every level, she was knee deep in that stuff. Right. That that's where I have to like issue some more skepticism because you know you you can study the the materials of people you disagree with or don't necessarily agree with. You know what I mean? So just because I have an interest in something, like for example. I'm interested in uh, the thoughts and ideas of a Bu Buddhist thinker. It doesn't make me a Buddhist, right? No, but, you know, you have to understand theosophy was this very, um, very groundbreaking, like, all-encompassing vision of the world. And the Russian elite in general at this time 
were definitely submerged in these ideas to look for a path outside of Christianity to deal with basically, you know, what we call the modern world. Mm -hmm. To cope with it and to, you know, understand their future. I mean, it's just the same kind of decadence of any elite that happens across history where they just start, you know, it's like Babylon, you know, they start to become interested in strange things and strange beings, right? And yeah, all, they start engaging in all these weird practices and doing these weird things um, for being humbled by the common man. Well, that, that makes me that makes me interested in your view uh, regarding Rasputin. I, I'm assuming you don't think uh, that he was a, a holy man. You think he was an occultist? I'm assuming. I could be wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, the truth is, I, I simply don't know enough about Rasputin in particular. He is a very enigmatic figure to me. Um, okay. I've heard conflicting descriptions of him, but that's all I can say. I him in particular, I'm not... His his occultism, I think, was not theos theosophical. His was from the old believers, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm leaning towards some kind of Christian mysticism. Yeah, I, I don't know enough. I'd have to investigate that more. Uh, okay. In America, we, we're taught about Rasputin before we're taught about Lenin. Because he's this... Um, he's this very... Uh, stereotypical figure of russian evil right mm -hmm. and then that that recent movie that was released of the british spies what is it called uh uh it's kingsman kingsman yeah kingsman kingsman the cia my six propaganda yeah yeah and then rasputin's literally a villain in that in that uh story because rasputin is like pull you know pulling rush out of the war or some shit i don't know so I mean, just the villainization of Rasputin that happens by um... my my. It's funny. My older brother told me that they um that in that film they infantilize Lenin and make him out to be like this spoiled idiot kid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's like that. The the reaction to Rasputin, um, in the let's say Anglo-Saxon imagination, me is interesting. I don't know. What's really going on there? Mm. Okay, yeah, no, it's that's not quite, and that's not the answer I expected, but that's good. It's a good answer. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't really have much more uh, on on that topic specifically because I know it is, you know, you are streaming on YouTube, so I, I don't want to get into it uh, too much because it, it's yeah. just unnecessary. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm looking at something really fast. I mean, is there something you wanted to add more about Dugan? Uh, because it is kind of getting late and I have to go soon. So. Yeah, I'll just add that uh, there is like an entire essay on uh, the Russian conservative revolution by Dugan. And like one of his uh, people that he cites as an influence inside of it is actually the Sternberg guy. <laughs> but That was from like the early 2000s? Yes, I believe so. Uh, he actually referenced Sternberg as one of the main influences on neo-Eurasianism. And uh, he was he was basically just like a monarchist who wanted to unite all of Asia, including yeah, he was, Russia. He was the guy in Mongolia. That... Yeah, then do a crusade yeah. against the West. But uh, yeah. I think Dugan, well, from what I've read, it seems like he's attracted to the aesthetical idea more. It just likes this idea of this um, merger with the Mongol um, kind of sacred traditions. Um, Dugan, he kind of, uh, Dugan began as a subversive, you know, he began as the kind of hippie in a way within the Soviet Union. So everything that was forbidden, everything that was prohibited, everything that was whatever, he was exploring that, you know, and he undergoes an interesting evolution and maturity where he appears extreme. He appears like a um, a Russian Ayatollah today, you know. But um, back in the day, he was like a guy who was recording songs with his guitar and stuff. But um, specifically, I think what's interesting 
there is some um, the transition he makes from this attempt to explore the possibility of a Russian Ariosophy in the mid '90s to uh, mid 2000s, I think is where I would put it. This going from relocating Russians as this kind of Aryan Aryanism to uh, Turan Turan Turanism, right? This basic idea that Atlanticism is Arianism is a form of Atlanticism is kind of the conclusion it comes to eventually. Uh, placing this kind of chronology from the Greeks through the Romans, Alexander the Great, through Napoleon, Hitler, and then finally NATO, and then the United States, he says. And then so here he kind of I think is the beginning of where he searches for what he calls the Russian logos instead of uh, exploring the forbidden Western logos, which defined a lot of his time. He wants to search for a unique Turanian Russian beginning. I, I do have a question since this is more acceptable to YouTube. Uh, what are your thoughts and views on Napoleon Bonaparte? Um, broadly positive, obviously okay. not in, in Haiti, but, uh, broadly I, I, I have, um, an appreciation. I like the idea of, I, you know, in some ways I see Napoleon as a Eurasianist. I see him as building an Asian empire in the heart of Europe. So this much I, um. Admire. Obviously, his military victories and successes are admirable. But I am not like um I don't like to make it MCU of history, right? So yes, I like Napoleon, but I also like the German guerrillas fighting Napoleon, right? Marx yeah. like and Marx's attitude was the same, basically. Mm -hmm. He likes both of them for different reasons. You're you're definitely right about Napoleon's struggle. Um and what he was trying to achieve. Uh, I think that's an apt description that you gave. It, also in terms of his enemies, the people that he was up against, they were uh, more or less the same powers and forces that I would say Stalin was up against uh, a little bit later. I was just about to say that um, Napoleon picked up the, uh, he picked up the shambles that were left by the French Revolution and reconstituted France as a, as a real what, power. What and, Sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, I was, I was also going to say that he also got rid of, like, a lot of corrupt leaders that um, that were in direct opposition to the masses and the people. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so. one one of the things I like about Napoleon, though, is that when I say he, he's building an Asian empire in Europe, it's also like he's, he's, he's like this reviver of civilization where somehow he, he, he starts to be able to respect others he doesn't he drops this kind of european arrogance and he starts to say like you know the english visited the chinese emperor and they said no we're not going to bow to the chinese emperor we're english we don't bow to anyone and Poland's like how could they you know that's that's so uh rude and barbaric like you know you everyone knows that when you're in another land you have to respect their customs and their laws I mean, he he had a lot yeah, of respect it, it was and, a it was a man of culture yeah precisely that's precisely it also, another, another thing I like about Napoleon is that, to me, Napoleon reveals the truth of the French Revolution. The French Revolution seems like the most modern thing ever, which is true, right? In a way, in a lot of ways. But then it's also, you see how the corruption of the ancient regime is also what gave birth to this, this revolution. And with Napoleon, he goes even further backwards in history. Than, bef than the ancient regime. He goes back to Charlemagne and this kind of Latin empire of Charlemagne. So this is also the structure of archaeomodernity described by Dugan. Yeah. A revolution takes us further into the past. It seems like this revolution is destroying the past, destroying all the tradition, but this destruction also corresponds to uh, even further deepening and awakening of tradition which I think is what happens with Napoleon, right? Somehow, 
they are returning to the Charlemagne Latin Empire in this kind of neoclassical renaissance, right? Uh, instead of this um, rationalistic madness of building everything from scratch based on nothing. Yeah. I mm. definitely agree with your assessment there regarding uh, revolution and destruction actually resulting in, in an increase in conservatism later down the line because I, I do see a clear pattern with how decadence and degeneracy kind of moves toe-to-toe -to -toe with uh comfort and uh the the yeah. the, the overall modern modernity the issues of modernity same same thing happened in, in china you know they had their cultural revolution and then after that there's literally a neo-traditionalism it's what it's called in yeah. china revival um right so to me that is a very clear dialectic Uh, what would you say about people who label uh, Stalin, but they also label the the Austrian painter and like kind of like a lot of anti Atlantis Atlanticist leaders nowadays? I've heard Maupin use the term, but they ca kind of called them like Bona Bonapartists, but he didn't necessarily he doesn't necessarily call Stalin that. It's more like Trotsky did that, but just kind of like people being called like Bonapartists. Do do you agree with that type of like label or association? So that that comes from Marx's. Uh his assessment not of bonaparte the first but of uh the third the third bonaparte um that's in his 18th brumaire of louis napoleon and that uh i i would not characterize the so stalin he was confronted with that idea too and stalin said bonaparte he was conquering europe and freeing all the serfs you know and in Stalin's view, the painter, he was just working at the behest of the banks to enslave Europe under this new regime of primitive accumulation to save a, a dying, this was Stalin's view, a dying capitalism. So Stalin said there can't be a comparison because one of them was this kind of revolutionary. The other one um, wasn't. But beyond that um, kind of debate, I guess, there's also the third world leaders, you know, Nasser and Sukarno and others. Uh, the question, are these Bonapartists, right? I, I, I think I would rather ask the question, what was Bonaparte? Does Bonaparte represent something, right? And that's why I kind of like the word Caesar, Caesarism better. Caesarism, like Hugo Chavez, who's like a, a, a Julius Caesar, right? And the, the Marxist, Michael Parenti, I don't know if you're familiar, he wrote a book called The History of Ancient Rome. The, it's called, sorry, The Assassination of Julius Caesar and the Class Struggle of Ancient Rome, where he basically identifies, you know, Julius Caesar as this like Hugo Chavez populist who's fighting against the elites and the aristocrats to fight for land reform. So, you know, I think there's something interesting there that maybe has been overlooked uh, in Marxism in general. Because... This, uh, yeah. I, I know I'm interrupting, but th this is interesting because, like, uh, the way we see the third way and the way you see Marxism though, like we disagree, it's kind of like looking in a mirror in a way, at least kind of, at least how it's coming off to me. I don't know how like pacifist feels. He's a bit more like a political, like monarchist type, but yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, exactly. I'm a political, but the way I see it is, yeah, you guys are, you have the same or similar logic, but your uh, framing is different as well as the maybe the etymology you're using. I think but I think it's probably more than that too, though, because I think uh, the dialectical view is probably what's most decisive here, right? <clears throat> so I think even in, in terms of like practice, probably there would be disagreement about practice, right? Like what is to be done, how to proceed. And I'm not saying this uh, under a strict left-right axis of difference, which in America does not have much meaning, right? At least for now, maybe in the future, 
there will re-emerge a left-right distinction among populists. But I think everyone's pretty much just a populist right now. I think the disagreement has more to do with kind of the relationship between thought and practice and how it is that change happens in reality. Things like that, you know? Um, also, uh, things like aesthetics and... But, I mean, broadly... Uh, those have not really acquired decisive significance. Because no one's built any movements, right? Right? There's not really anywhere. The closest we've had is what? MAGA movement for populism. But that's kind of uh, being hijacked by DeSantis now. So, I want to say really quick that you would find this interesting. There's actually a thing called the Annual Review of Political Science, Center-Right Political Parties and Advanced Democracies. It, this also applies to like center-left political parties. But the, the study basically concludes that, uh, quote-unquote, yet cohesive center-right and center-left parties have facilitated political stability and compromises while their disintegration has empowered radical challengers. And it actually goes on to talk about how they have to prevent people from radical right or radical left from getting any traction. So they have to try and maintain uh, the, the center to maintain the status quo. They're, they have a strategy for that. And their strategy has basically been that they're adopting the culture and the veneer of the extreme or the populist, let's say, but they're maintaining the structure and the connections and the networks of the status quo. So on the yeah, right, uh, I, yeah, I got into a disagreement with a guy. I actually labeled Trump as that as kind of like a pressure valve, kind of like Bernie Sanders to their pressure valves. So, but but it's evolved past that now, and now you have um, Ron DeSantis. I don't know if you know that guy, but he's I super. Do. Yeah, he's super. Uh, you know, culture war, hundred percent. He's like a Ted Cruz. He's, but he's a big crusader, uh, culture war wise. Right, he's known for that. That's what he. That's what gets him recognition and clout. But that's a guy who's in the pocket of the deep state. He's a globalist, right? Um, he's a neocon as well. And you know, the the MAGA movement is not seeing that because of what he's getting famous for, which is his stuff against wokeness and and woke culture. Then on the left, obviously you have Bernie, you have, I think even more significant now is the squad, AOC, those people. And, you know, the thing is, is that DeSantis and Bernie and the squad are the same. When I say they're the same, they may disagree about cultural bullshit, whatever, but in terms of their underlying policies, right, underlying plans for America and America's foreign relations, it's pretty much the same fucking thing right so you know it's just that's that's what's going on to destroy the populism of 2016 right now is they're appropriating the culture and the language um just to do people and supporting the status quo there's a book you would probably like uh called uh, on power at centralization and growth by a guy called uh, bernard juvenel he was a liberal but he basically talks about how you had all these like patron uh interests that would uh kind of like f influence political movements and it would use language as a as a large focus to kind of like defang radical movements and make them subordinate to the the status quo and he actually focuses on how intersectionality was used to do that to the the left for example and he also talks about how that was done to like a a lot of radical nationalist uh, movements with uh, kind of like center right parties. You would probably find interesting. Well, there there were also a bunch of uh, declassified CIA documents that talk about um, introducing uh, third wave feminism and identity politics. Well, like modern the art in America's CIA project. Yeah, uh, they, they they talk about introducing these. Um, these political artifacts into discourse in, in order to throw off um, because there was like a huge, huge labor movement in the United States. You, you probably already know about like FDR and CPUSA and the inf influence of William Z. Foster and all that shit. Um, but like, because that was gaining more and more traction, especially with the rise of like uh, rainbow coalition and stuff like that, they had to come up with a way to delegitimize uh, these movements. 
it seemed like FDR was definitely more of a reaction to Huey Long, but I get what you mean. Yeah, I mean, um, the, the, I think the relevant point is there is one, there's one uh, center, and this is not a partisan thing to say. It's not an ideological thing to say. I mean, we are probably a very different ideological, but I mean, no matter who you are, you can just acknowledge, right, that the people in power are trying to stay in power. And they don't really care about the language that they have to use. They don't really care about what ways they have to signal. They don't really care about, you know, what they have to say publicly to do that. And, you know, both the center right and the center left are basically trying to recapture um, deviating forms of politics, whatever they are, back into the status quo. And that's all it serves, right? It's not like they're not really, I mean, these people are interchangeable, right? They don't really care uh, if they have to be center right or have to be center left. I mean, the whole point is like, okay, if the, if the public or a section of the public is going a little bit too left, we have to bring them back in. If they're going a little bit too uh, right or whatever, we have to bring, because they see them as the same thing. They see it as populism. And what populism means today is more or less, um, this is how I put it, right? After World War II, after 1929, the collapse of, of capitalism as we know it, right? You have this total, um, total t subsumption of the populace under these state and corporate institutions, right? State, corporate, and civil institutions. So it's like as human beings, we've become completely domesticated by these institutions, so the populism we start seeing, um, you know, uh, after the so-called neoliberalism, that is not the same as the one in the past, right, from 100 years ago. That's some kind of weird aligned velocity that is taking over and animating populations to somehow break out of the Gnostic prison that was created uh, in the West after World War II. And, you know, that, that is something that they have many, it's almost, it's literally almost like the matrix, it's like this weird thing where it's like, they have to send in the agent Smith, you know, fucking rain in on people who are kind of taking the red pill. Doesn't matter. I'm not saying this to be like, oh yeah, left and right doesn't mean anything. Um, in America, it doesn't, but I'm saying this because it, the ideology literally does not matter. The question is. Is it trying to break out of this domestication by, of, of the people by institutions? Uh, and, and, and kind of... That, and, and, you know, it draws into question something really interesting, right? What the fuck is the source of the state's power? It's not just holding office anymore. Somehow the source of the state's power has become called into question just by information, just by all these different feedback loops of information and people forming communities around different ideas and different ideologies and, you know, different visions of the world, the state's monopoly on reality is being broken down. And they're trying to, that's a bug, that's a bug in the matrix that they're trying to patch by learning the art of signaling one way, but doing another way. That's it's like how it's like how they found out that over 50 percent of Joe Biden's Twitter followers were all bots. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. They're like they're they're they've they they it's 2016 was this explosion of how digital information was was challenging the state somehow. Right. Challenging the globalist deep states or deep state, I should say. So they have basically deployed all of these mechanisms to, to curtail that. So one of the ways has been bots, which Aether mentioned. Uh, troll farms is something they use. Um, operations they use to discredit and delegitimize personalities. Black propaganda. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, they... Um... Radio Free Europe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, they, they also, yeah, and just the discrediting and delegitimizing people. They also deploy counter signaling through disguise, like the DeSantis kind of deception that's going on. Um, you know, rechanneling these malign uh, 
uh, velocities back into the direction of supporting the status quo. <clears throat> so that's, you know, that's kind of a something not a lot of people it's, have thought about. You also have to like take how... dig in, if you, you know, if you want to go ahead, you can. I was just about to say you also have to take into consideration that some of these groups are pressure release valves to control and maintain the anger that's already evolving into the spirit that's, well, as you said, so in 2016, for example, leftists went towards Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders proposed a lot more, quote unquote, radical policies than any of his leftist counterparts. Trump, on the other hand, proposed a lot more radical policies than any of his right wing counterparts. But both of these were uh, pressure release valves to center all those people going into those radical spheres into a much more, quote unquote, modern or less pressurized that, state of affairs. Yeah, th that's one way of interpreting it. But there's also kind of like how, you know, they did really sell out. You know, they did really kind of at some point betray their movements that they created, right? Because maybe the potential was there and they were pressure valves. But I, I'm, I'm kind of a guy who thinks, and maybe this is just a difference we might have, right? Because of our ideologies. But I tend to privilege actuality over potentiality right so i yeah, think I can understand that. yeah like I, I like to pay more mm -hmm. attention to how it actualizes and uh, I, I i feel like in a lot of ways like politics is, is kind of like spectacle at least like within like current politics but a lot of the ways that they've maintained the control and same with like these candidates too that kind of go in a lot of it's done through like institutional controls so that they have they have different institutions or different frameworks people can go throughout society, but it's controlled. And when they have these institutions, they compete with each other to kind of give the illusion that there's difference, but it's controlled by the same group. And then they have these things like pariah status and language they use to delegitimize their enemies. Like, uh, oh, that guy's a white supremacist. That guy's a fascist. That dude's a, like the, the, red, the red scare stuff that you saw Trump doing. And it's just a, a way to maintain legitimacy. But if you look at who they had around them when they were going in the first place. Sanders, even when he was being a populist, had connections with a lot of the uh, the same people that were corrupt within the system already. Even yeah, like Trump, yeah, he was connected mean, with like Kushner. No, I mean, yeah, it's it's clear to me Sanders was inevitably going to sell out. I mean, that's very clear. But you know, I I um I still think the move were like real things. You know? Just maybe they 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 were weak or short-sighted and being able to anticipate the inevitable but you know um i think the movements were real the maga movement was real the bernie stuff was real it's just they were there was led by okay well i, I just there, want to was real, there was an authentic um there was an authentic like populistic uh upsurge of interest and enthusiasm because of those two figures my i remember my father said that in the instance that that trump doesn't win the primaries for the republican primary he said i'm voting for bernie i mean and, i voted for trump in 2016 too but i never voted yeah. again also, what i wanted to say uh with that whole um argument is when you have pressure release valve the sentiment and the belief can be very authentic like the trump movement itself like within the people, within the population, that was authentic. The Sanders movement, that was authentic. But that doesn't mean that it's head of the snake, let's say, isn't from a malicious source or a controlled opposition source. And I do believe those yeah. movements. No, I think from the very beginning, they were planning on, they were those were bad actors, Bernie and Trump yeah. from the beginning. I agree with that. But I, I think there is a reality of the move not reducible to that. That makes sense. You would probably like Juvenel again regarding this because he actually has a he he does a reform of uh, class dynamics and he actually concludes that the, it isn't like you don't have organic grassroots uh, like appearances. He actually rejects the the idea of there being like any grassroots populism being able to gain legitimacy, and he actually makes the argument that uh, all p politics is basically elite versus elite yeah, so he's like a very yeah, i've and it's a synthesis with populism that creates the change that's i i talked about that on stream a few weeks ago because 
Yeah, that is definitely true. It's it's always shit within the elite that every revolution in history, I mean, every every political change in history is never just because maybe like there's slave rebellions and there's rebellions that get squashed immediately, but it's always because of the contradictions within the elite that a revolution happens. And you know, I mean, look at the the February revolution was a contradiction within the Russian elite, you know? Between the actually and the uh, that th that perfectly segues into your hypothesis that um Elon Musk and Moldbug and um Peter, uh, and Peter Thiel may be the uh uh, uh maybe the the guard the leading guard of this new new movement but, that runs counter. But here's why I don't think so anymore. They or, want CEO monarchists. <laughs> The thing, but I'm super skeptical of that now because guess what Musk did a few days ago? He, he endorsed DeSantis, president. Oh. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I mean, I've always been un, un, uneasy, right? So I, yeah. I don't think it's gonna come from Musk. I think there's probably some other source. Um. In the ruling class, Who knows right? It's hard to locate. They will right. definitely pick somebody to. It, the, things are going to have to de destabilize and delegitimize more, probably probably before that happens. So, like, actually having the economy get worse and fall through under Biden's incompetency would probably be the best scenario. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I, I think Biden is. It's very clear that they're all anticipating. He accelerated Biden. it all. <laughs> yeah. they, they are expecting him to fail. Yeah, they're, they, all, they, they're all anticipating. Biden was like even, never meant... even CNN. Buchanan even... was estimating by 2040 that we would fall, but Biden is like Jesus, dude. <laughs> yeah. Even CNN like hung him out to dry. They were just like, the economy's failing under Biden's presidency. <laughs> even CNN just well, gave what, up. what we're looking at to just skip, you know, TLDR. They're they're pretty much planning all of this um, failure and food shortages and all this shit that's happening. Because they're they're accelerating a crisis that, and I don't know how they're gonna do it, but I know what they intend to do is to use this crisis to usurp, basically usurp the constitution as we know it, and implement emergency powers to have a full on dictatorship, global you know, ruling class, as as we know. And then that's how they're going to implement their degrowth kind of agenda for population reduction and, you know, a bunch of other spooky stuff. So, Gentlemen, uh, I don't mean to detract, but it's very late on my end, so I have to leave. But it was a great conversation. Yeah, I yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we could, you know, have a civil talk. Look, I, I, I do want to specify, like, the reason why I've been so hostile like towards you is because after we debated i had people constantly going on my channel doing stuff so i had to keep deleting the comments plus i saw memes so i started doing the same thing in response to it yeah i mean look we're both grown men and at the end of the day that's just shit on the internet and you know given the situation we you know if, if we can just talk civilly and maturely about shit may as well just do that you know there's no like yeah. I, i'm just gonna i'm just gonna say it like Operation Barbarossa never should have happened. One struggle, but like, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, um, you know, I, I, I really do disagree with you, um, ideologically, obviously, and and about history. But like, you know, that's no reason for not being able to uh, discuss and and exchange ideas. You know, like, if if I'm to be straight up, like, my mission is like what I'm trying to do with my channel is I want to separate what I currently work with the third way. I want to separate it completely from its modernist baggage that it had historically and move it to a capital T traditionalism, kind of like what Evola wanted to do. And that's more or less what I want to do. And like, I probably won't ever identify as a communist as I don't agree with dialectical materialism, but we do have more commonalities and there is differences, but it's okay to disagree. Yeah, I mean, I just think, you know, in the future, there's there's no need to, like, you know, declare war just because of a difference of ideas, you know? I'm not one of those leftists who is, like, you know, 
draws a line based on the idea, you know. The, the line should be drawn based on, like, actions. Because otherwise, we're just, we don't have any power over anything. We're just sitting here awaiting to be completely deplatformed and probably put in jail sometime, to be honest. <laughs> I, so I, it's uh, like, I've already been detained by the off. FBI once. Z yeah. Zoltan is, um, I, I think, just me personally, I, I don't know if that's, I don't know if it's possible for you to separate third positionism from all of this uh, baggage and controversy. Because even even Dugan himself, uh, he, he repeatedly talks about how like all, all of the tragedies of the past that had that had uh, undergone under these this ideology. Well, I mean, so, th look. To be fair, every, all ideologies. Everybody's still um, evolving and developing what where they already are. So it's like you know, maybe maybe you'll. It will go down the same path Dugan did, or maybe you'll take a different path, or who knows. But we're we're all pretty much just communities cultivating uh, a, a pedagogy of some kind, right? So you know, it it really just comes down to being able to maturely disagree. Uh, well, another announcement with Mikado, by the way. Next week on Sunday, I'm going to be having Mikado on from New Resistance. Fourth position in this group, it works very closely with Dugan. Uh, he did message me on Facebook. So apparently, he's going to be trying to get Dugan on for an interview with me, too. So that may actually happen. I'm kind of hoping it does. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean... Uh, Should be interesting if Michael he does. Michael Millerman has reviewed uh, one of my texts. I've seen it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, mean I, I, I definitely think... You know what? What I want to ask Dugan or people who know Dugan is, uh, he needs his books to be translated. You know, I mean, for God's sake, what I would do to read "In Search of a Dark Logos" or uh, Heidegger, the Philosopher of Another Beginning. I mean, these are books. Even his work, um, "Foundations of Geopolitics," has not been translated to English. So I will just probably learn Russian sometime just to be able to read. Is there a specific? The, the interesting thing is, there's actually a guy, Antelope Pill, which is a uh, third way like uh, publication. They actually have a Slavic guy who's been translating some of Dugan's stuff that's not translated, and they may end up publishing it. From what I've heard, the the issue though with a lot of Dugan's material is that it's actually a lot of his books are like kind of like shadow banned. They don't like you can still buy them, but they're like almost impossible to find because yeah, a lot of uh, the, the publications political... ban it. Political Platonism is like you have to. You have to I actually own a copy. Yeah, let me see. I, if I can find I've it. read it like multiple times at this point, but you have to. I had to get it on something called Nuke, Nook, whatever. Like it's not on Amazon. It's not on. It's on some like Barnes and Noble app, Nook or some shit. So I that's where something it is obscure. digitally. But you can also get it from uh, another place. Well, I don't know if I can say on YouTube. There's there's other ways of getting that book. Digitally, but um, I had to uh, my copy I bought from uh, Abe Books for Fourth Political Theory because they t they also uh, Amazon used to sell an English translated copy of Foundations of Geopolitics, but then they took it down or they they delisted it. You know, it's it's funny because there's nothing, there's nothing offensive in any of those fucking books, <laughs> almost nothing. I mean, political Platonism at least. There's like. There's Fine. nothing offensive in that in that book that I remember. Well, if they're banning it, they obviously found something "quote unquote" offensive. Like, I, I get what you mean by offensive, like in the terms of like. I, I think know, I the, think they're just general political, but I think they just are yeah. banning him. You know, I think they're just saying, you know what, Dugan's not allowed on Amazon because he's a he's a scary Russian. I mean, I can't he, find he, it. <laughs> he, he does propose. He does propose in his works to discombobulate internally, discombobulate the United States. And it's a plethora of Americans getting their eyes on that literature and on that material would be a net bad to the social power. I can actually tell you something interesting on uh, Telegram. There's actually like a large network of like uh, white nationalist types. I usually refer to them as racist libs because they don't really care about any economic or philosophy. That is kind of like my race, my race. Basic as but the whites. Yeah, well, they basically labeled me as like a Duganite Nazbol 
then there's like entire entire channels dedicated to to me and pacifist as so like doxing but some other guys we've a uh, whose information we got we haven't released have, uh, have kind of been like we've, we've traced some of them to like actual like ngo related groups that's yeah that's fucking weird yeah there's there's yeah. a lot of glowy shit there going was, on all over like there even some... even striker regardless of what you guys think about his politics he's like an open nat sock but kind of like where you had like a lot of these like extreme glowy groups like adam waffen who are like get, promote siege and they go around like doing terrorist attacks and all that they uh they traced one of the groups that was uh, associated with with them Mar uh, i think it's martinez press of temple of blood which was like an 09a thing and they were literally owned by like a federal informant yeah yeah i yeah i i know i've heard about that so yeah i mean i think you know what we we can all just be libs you know what do i mean by libs we can all just be true liberals in the sense of like you know uh we just want a freedom of uh freedom of reading books and freedom of talking about ideas and you know, we don't want to be oppressed by this fucking totalitarian, weird fucking uh, state that has all this glo glowy activity and all this shit. We just want to be uh, good, good uh, old fashioned liberals and uh, have a good old fashioned civil society. Right? When I was, what, what I mean by saying this is just, uh, you know, liberals are not necessarily in a political alliance. But they're all just, you know, just free thinking individuals who can freely uh, explore and exchange ideas without, without, uh, without attacking one another, one another over disagreement that don't yet have any practical mm -hmm. reality. So that's what I mean about being. Uh, bizarro world liberals liberal underground right <laughs> well one thing interesting is one of my friends who's actually russian and uh has actually been involved in the ukraine conflict he actually encountered this group called misanthropic division and they're basically like uh yeah kind of like azov but they're like satanists that are like satanist neo-nazis and they actually have connections with uh, the 09A people, and then apparently they've get, they've given training to people associated with uh, Adam Waffen, now like the American Futurist crowd. So they literally went there, got training from these dudes, and they're like connected to the State Department. And then they come back here, and then they do like glowy stuff, telling people to like attack brown people, basically. And then they go around labeling like. Uh, other white nationalists they don't like quote unquote who are too pro Russian as like Nazbols and smearing them and, into and the goal the goal is ultimately to increase state repression and associate anyone who's opposing the status quo with terrorism. Yeah. If you, I mean they uh, did the same thing with also, Islam after nine eleven. Yeah. 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 There's also uh there's Operation Eurodynamics, which was uh, which has been in full effect since 1954. That was deployed within the uh, within the western region of Ukraine, where they subverted the more Polish identifying population against the more Slavic identifying population, uh, and they they stowed, uh, they stoked like civil unrest within that nation, which you saw uh, come to a headway with the Odessa Trade House massacre, where you had um, you had like uh, people, people of the Donbass, like getting burnt alive in Soviet trade house buildings and shit. Um, so they've been. Oh, I've seen those videos. Been, it was done by Right Sector, I believe, right? <clears throat> yeah, they've been working overtime. Uh, CIA's been working overtime on this shit. The uh, you would probably like Juvenile again because like he actually talks about a lot of medieval history where they were actually doing this, where like the crown would actually use Protestant Christianity to go against like. Uh, the Catholicism to try and weaken their authority to strengthen the, the 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 national crown authority, but then the religious institutions would then turn on the crown itself. But it like there's a guy called CIA Bond who did a book called Nemesis that kind of talks about this in the modern society and how America uses it. An example of them doing that, besides what you just gave, would actually be in the Middle East where they where you have them kind of like placate to the Islamic divides between uh, Sunni and Shia, for example. And then they'll prop up fake groups to basically like attack other groups of Islam that are more pro-East 
and it creates like this fake divide where you basically create infighting within Islam. Yeah, it's yeah. basically it's basically a game of ideological partisans, except it's not well, on the battlefield. Well, I can th- well, I can think I can think that as neo Nazis, like they did this with Pol Pot too. Yeah, I they've think, been doing I think it the, the conclusion to be drawn from everybody listening and everybody here is this is the age of information warfare. You got to really be savvy about information how it's used because you know we're living in the matrix um information is is the code that's how basically access reality and you know there's a lot of ways that can be manipulated so everybody's got to stay smart and be smart about you know what the fuck is going on it's easy you know the 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 the, you know logo he pointed this out Discord is the most glowy fucking platform of any any of them. Everyone knows that. It's literally fucking called Discord. So information is just yeah. this way to use to cause Discord in language and discourse to basically control people, right? Form communities around specific points of Discord, control them, point use them against each other, uh, that kind of shit, right? So the, the, the first key to being able to overcome this shit is not attaching your entire, uh, you know, online followings and communities just to language, right? That's what political correctness is too, right? But there's also another form of political correctness, which is ideological, which means like, if you disagree with my ideology or say something in contradiction to it, you are enemy, right? So, you know, to me, it's like, that's how you got to be savvy in the information age. Because if, if you're not savvy about it, you can get fucking controlled in every possible way. I got, um, after I started like being more active on Twitter and stuff, um, I've gotten death threats and people say like really nasty, messed up shit to me in my messages uh threatening to kill me my my mother was like a victim of like a phishing thing someone got a hold of my contacts and they fucking sent her death threats and like sent her pictures of dead bodies and people with their heads cut off and so like it it like after uh i was just like relating to it was Zoltanis and uh and uh and uh fascist was talking about like they get docs and stuff like I know Haas and Samira have received like the most nastiest fucking messages and people whenever Samira comes on stream sometimes we get random people in the YouTube chat just saying nasty shit about them and it's just I don't know why like I, I don't yeah. know why people have to take it to that place I don't understand Bro, I, I never take it to that place. I literally had white nationalists on telegram and spamming me videos of gore CP and then oh like gay blacked porn they were just spamming me with that they didn't like me (laughs) yeah so i mean yeah i mean on that note though i mean it is really late for me so uh i gotta uh okay wrap this up but you know i'm I'm glad we could have a civil civil conversation sort out these i'll go ahead and apologize for being hostile yeah yeah let's let's let it be water under the bridge you know going forward we can just disagree maturely right mm-hmm. so okay yeah all right well see you guys see you see you i'm talking to you all right yo what up everybody so it kind of sucks i didn't have time to like give an independent lecture on on this topic but, um, you know, um, let me update the description, add some stuff to it. But, um, you know, I, I went into that and I thought about it a little bit before and I was like, you know, let's just actually talk about the meat and potatoes. I don't want to like fucking get into. I'm too old. I'm too mature. 
for the bullshit, right? And, you know, I'm too old for that bullshit, you know? Let's get into the mean potatoes. Thank you so much, Void, bro. Appreciate you, Void, God bro. didn't give us the Communist Manifesto, but God gave man the ability to critically think well enough to write the Communist Manifesto. That's, Based. yeah, that's kind of what I was getting at. Thank you for Thanks for the education, us. This is the way we all learn. Yeah, that's what I wanted. I wanted, like, something that you guys could Based. take something away from. I met my father when I was 17. His father was C.P. Usa, in Brooklyn, 30s and 40s. My father was staunchly oh. Marxist slash communist slash pro-Stalin, and he was rapidly atheist and anti-religion. Base. Thank you. Lysenko? Visit covid.governor get the facts on COVID-19. Thank you so much, Jan R. Good morning, Revolution. Good morning, Revolution, Emilio. So why is this chat so weird? Oh, Good this morning, is the wrong Revolution. chat. So, okay. That was the wrong chat. This is the Based. right chat. I think our difference is between absolute idealism and dialectic materialism. The yeah, human will yeah, does not determine the dialectic. Base. Well, thank you. W. Jan R. Thank you so much, Jan R. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you, Jan R. Good morning, Revolution. Good morning, Revolution, EJ. Good morning, Revolution. Got red in this bitch. Sorry, I came into the stream so late. You basically had it handled when I came in. No, don't worry about it, man. Red in this bitch. Red in this bitch. Thank you so much, Voidburn, for letting us see some red. All right, I'm going to pee. I'll be right back. I'm going to pee, and then um, we're going to make this Swedish. Okay? I'm going to pee.
Hey guys, uh, we are gonna have a sweet. They did. This is horrible. This is horrible. It gave me fries again. He gave me fries. I mean, first of all, I'm getting rid of the onions. We, we, society has progressed past the need for onions. But anyway, y'all gotta take some time to appreciate this Swedish meal. So, guys, I will be right back. Uh, be right back. This is chicken. I've never used this. I'm testing it out. Thank you, EJ. Thank you, EJ. Based. Warlock. Zolt and such are just confused white guys who really hate liberals. Franco Frida? It's so silly. Thank you so much, Chris Malak. The green is bitch. Are you a good tipper? Um, are you a good tipper? Because y'all are the ones who pay for my food. But yes. I'm an egregiously good tipper. Even when they fuck me over, I still tip. Fine, here's your tip. When I was in LA, there was one time that I got mad where I was like, I'm not tipping them. Still tipped them anyway. I always tip. And I tip a lot. I'm a, I'm a, it's like a level of cuck levels of tipping. Here, take my money. See, I tip a lot. I just complain about it. I'm like, okay, fine. I'm a greedy tipper. No, on a 10 to $15 meal, I'll tip like anywhere from 5 to $8. I tip a lot. When I sit down at a restaurant to eat, I tip a fuck ton. When I have someone deliver food, I tip a fuck ton. The worst I'll do is 20% on Uber Eats. I'll just like click 20% after I get the meal. I'll be like, yeah, fuck you. So, but I always tip. I always do tip. Do I litter? 
Um, no. But not because I'm a moral person. But just because I can't get away with it anymore. Every time I litter, you know, I feel like I'll get caught. So I just don't. Why the fuck did that donut not go through? Can I have a bite, please? I'm starving. No. But thank you for the tip. Based. Are there any good books or sources on Freemason history and symbolism? No. Not that I can think of. But thank you for the 10. All right. No more fries. Is it really 140? Damn. Damn, Chad, look at the time. Y'all enjoying yourself? I wanna, I wanna uh, actually do one last thing, which is react to some shit, because uh, this is some cool. This is some cool. So look how fucking based Alex Stein is. So Alex Stein is actually a real conservative. Because he goes after the fake one. Like Dan Crenshaw. 
And he calls out Dan Crenshaw for being a globalist. He does. What a fucking badass. This is why I love Alex Stein. Shout out Alex Stein. It's unfathomably based. I passed McCain. Hey, I passed McCain. Look at I passed McCain right here. Call them I patch McCain. You're a rhino. You're a globalist. You're a globalist rhino. You're a globalist rhino. Kid, you're a globalist rhino. I pass McCain. I pass McCain. I pass McCain. You're a globalist rhino. You're a globalist rhino. You know, the more I think about it, it takes a lot of gall for I Patch McCain to attack moms who are worried about baby formula as, quote, pro-Russia. I mean, that's probably one of, that's one of the most outrageous things I think I've ever heard. Unfathomably based. Unfathomably based. Alex Stein is such a fucking cool guy. That's a principal guy, but that's, a, that's, that's somebody who's not bought out, by the way. You know, a, a conservative who's bought out is going to protect people like Crenshaw. Right? Alex Stein, he's an independent man. That guy's not bought out by anyone. It's a guy who stands for what he considers the truth. And therefore deserves the respect of anyone against the status quo. All right. All right, guys. Remember tomorrow. No stream because it's Father's Day. Remember that. Remember that. Trust in me. Yeah.
listen to my acapella Girl, I go higher than the weapons for us now Baby, I'm moving on in life Move 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 on in I don't know what to do. I don't know if I have an enemy. There are so many out there. How can I say goodbye to all of them? Now you listen to me. All these people out there, it's your job. It's your duty.